to digest higher rates for longer will take time. I don't think rates need to go any further than where they are today. It's not so much the level of the rates that's the problem, it's the adjustment. What's going on in market is quite different to what's going on in the real economy. The economic soft landing narrative is definitely being challenged. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keene back in New York. Well, some of us are back in New York. <laughs> Farrow on assignment. Lisa Abramowitz and myself to bring you a most interesting Monday on radio, on television. And Lisa, we can just get to the national rate adjustment that's going on, a veritable soup of higher yields. I'm going to go moments ago, the U.S. 10-year real yield out to new levels. I have 2.11, rounded up 2.12%. That's a higher yield. The highest real yield, inflation-adjusted yield, going back to 2009 at a time where it's something that has something else to do than just inflation. It has something to do other than growth. There is something else going on, and Deutsche Bank put out a note saying this is partly quantitative tightening and this is partly something else, not tied to traditional reasons for why yields are going high. Can't emphasize enough how much I agree with that. Olivia Blanchard talks about other factors. We're going to go over the other factors here as we stagger into October. One of the other factors we have, and I didn't see this in London, I get back to New York where there are no for sale signs up, bank rate 30 percent, 30 year mortgage rather, bank rate 30. 7.75% two days ago. You wonder where that will print later this morning. And we've been talking about who's paying it, right? I mean, that's the sort of question is, is this actually going into effect? Michael McDonough over in our Bloomberg Intelligence uh, right. Unit, our Bloomberg Economics came out and said that basically the average monthly payment has gone to about $2,300 from less than $1,000 in March 2020. That there is this feeling of just things getting more expensive in the basic day-to-day -day necessities. You know, there's a number of swirls going on this morning, folks, and one of them is China, a mystery of what China is going to do. One of them is a strike. One of them is a shutdown. Good news from Hollywood. I mean, at least we got, thank God there's something out there. There's a difference between the screenwriters and the actors. Right. They wait on tables in different parts of the exactly. restaurant. Exactly. I think the screenwriters wait on the ones in the back and the actors are in That's front. That's what it they're is. They're usually the front-facing <clears throat> ones. Okay, there is that good news. But I will say, is there the word quadfecta? I was thinking about this because everyone talks about the trifecta. But there's kind of a quadfecta brewing yeah. behind the scenes. There's the auto strikes, the government shutdown, student loan repayments, and higher gas prices. You put those together, any one of those couldn't necessarily derail the U.S. economy. But increasingly, in a lot of the reports that I read overnight, there was a question around, if put together, this is a different kind of, if you will, toxic the tensions brew. there. This, yeah. to me, you know, yeah. each one of them, eh, it doesn't matter. You put them together, suddenly <clears throat> something feels different. What you, we're in a new studio here. I what know. do you think? It's like, you know, it brings back memory. I teared up, I, you know, me and Scarlett Fu and Sarah Eisen. I just, I got all emotional when I walked yeah. in the, the big room. It's, you, it's they're nice they're going to put a brass plaque outside, the Alex Steele room. That's what they're going <laughs> to Well, I know. Do. I think that John isn't going to come back until we resolve the government shutdown issue. Yeah, well, I think you know, he's, he's, he's particularly he's, frustrated he's on by the issue. Now, uh, to say the least. We should say we are building a new edifice for your morning attention. They're in working on it. And so for four or five weeks, we're going to be here as well. The data check's the same whether we're here are in our new new studio, which you'll see. The VIX 17.83 says it all. Futures are in. The Gloom Cruise picked up on a number of those things Lisa uh, was talking about, including China real estate. We'll touch on that. But negative three on the SPX futures. I've got nothing else really uh, working here. We'll talk about the drawdown later. Uh, we got to do Bitcoin because John's not here. 26,000. Greifeld's up early watching. So Good. we have to do I'm Bitcoin. I'm glad you did that. Thank you very much. Yields elevated. And this is the key point. We are 4.49%, almost a 4.5% on the 10-year yield. 210 spread gives us some disinversion. That's a really important philosophy. Jim Bianco land uh, there. That real yield, 2.12% is right where we are. That is an absolute key determinant for me. I look at dollar strength. We haven't really broken out to new dollar strength. But yen rounded up 149. I wonder how they uh, deal with that. What do you see in Lisa the data? Before you do the brief, what's in the data that gets your attention? Crude. 
Going back up. Thank you. And I think that that's interesting, the fact that on WTI, you're above $90 once again, and that there was actually data over the weekend showing that hedge funds are now the <clears> most <throat> bearish, uh, yeah, the most, most yeah. bullish, excuse it, me, the most bullish on crude on WTI in particular, going back to February of 2020. We've got to come back to this on short selling. Br 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 do the brief now, because young Kyle was going to hang up if we don't get to him. <laughs> All right. Well, you know how you don't like Fed speak. There are seven Fed speaks uh, this Stop. week. Seven That's Fed speakers this week. This okay. week. Just well, this week today. alone. No, Minneapolis they Fed President Neil Kashkar at 6 p.m. Uh, today. Tomorrow we have Fed Governor Michelle Bowman. Thursday, the big bonanza of Fed speak. Fed Chair Jay Powell, Fed Governor Lisa Cook, Chicago Fed President Austin Coolsby, and Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin. And on Friday, the Fed's John Williams. Whether they really lean into this idea that they are done, because it seems like that right now in the literature, Ellen Zentner among them, saying, they are done. Earnings, and this to me is really a big deal, especially off of Mike Wilson's comments over the weekend. Retail earnings in particular. Tuesday, Costco, this is fourth quarter, fourth quarter. Wednesday, H&M nice. and Micron, that is nice. the whole uh, semis kind of question. And Thursday is Nike. Curious to see uh, whether these are bespoke stories or whether we get a theme yeah. that starts to come together. And on the economic data front, you talk about home prices and the mortgage rates. Well, we get home price data as well as new home sales, just how much this market is broken. We get that tomorrow. Jobless yeah. claims Thursday. And personal income spending and core PCE on Friday, that is nice key. Nice brief. The consumer, how much does, do they really continue to surprise to the upside the way a lot of the economic data has? This really lays out the week ahead, folks. It's not a sleepy week into October. No. And I, for the first time, you can look at this, folks, on the Bloomberg Professional Service on the DES screen, the description screen, a, f a plethora of data there. They have uh, <laughs> JP Morgan, October 13th. Yes, I saw that. O October 13th. They've also got... December 14th, which is when the Bruins pull ahead of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Joining us now, Luke Kawa, Asset Allocation Strategist, UBS Asset Management. What did you write about this weekend, Luke? What is the distinction you see in literally the cacophony of news we have? Oh, this uh, this weekend is a lot more reading than than writing as per usual. But uh, very interesting for us to watch as we as we go into year end. A couple of things that seem like you know, pretty big highlights or things that markets will be resolving is one. A lot of the as Lisa's noted, there's the I'll call it the quintet. Throw in higher rates in there too into the mix of things the U.S. economy will be dealing with. We're dealing with a bit of a turn in the in the second derivative of U.S. growth from Q3 into Q4. So the most consistent trend in markets since May we would say, has been U.S. growth both accelerating and surprising to the upside. That's something that's going to change. Uh, on the other hand, two of the biggest uh, you know, drags for markets, arguably, in the past couple months have been that resilience of U.S. growth that's driven the part of the higher real yield story, also certainly elements of, of term premia and supply in there. Uh, but that uh, possibly changing as a second derivative of, of U.S. growth changing and getting a little stability. So that relationship to us is, is really at the fore in, in terms of right. what we look at as, as driving markets for the coming three months. Aquinas, be sure that Luke gets the memo that we don't do Newtonian calculus on Mondays. There's a great rule about that. Luke, you've got a really, really smart idea that earnings haven't deteriorated. And yet the zeitgeist this morning is, should I sell stocks? Dovetail a non-deterioration of earnings with the idea I really want to get out of equities. Well, I guess we would take the the other view to that. We're not necessarily uh, we're not necessarily you know adding risk, adding cyclicality into this into this pullback at this time. But you know our view is that that real underlying story is what's going to to win out at the end. That there is a limit to how much good news for the economy can be bad news for stocks in terms of the the valuation pressure. That you really are going to have uh, the the real key driver of earnings growth. And you know by the way. Since S and P 500 peaked for this year, S and P 500 earnings estimates 12 month forward still up another three percent. We think that's ultimately the story that's really going to win out when it comes to the equity market. But we, you know, we're very cognizant that you know some of the signs we've seen in markets recently. I would say you know credit spreads perking up a little bit. Some of the outperformance of, of defensive equities. Those are just things that you know have us uh, on alert, on watch. I would say. So Luke, just if you could frame where you are because you have been bullish uh, for quite a bit. Whether you're becoming less. Bullish now, uh, just because of the quintfecta or whatever you want to call it, the five different areas coming together, I can see Tom looking at me like, what did you just make up? Yes, I'm trying to make up words on this Monday. But, you know, at what point do you start to become less bullish and start to look for signs that maybe things are turning and the economic data is going to start surprising on the downside in a more substantial way? 
Well, I think one thing that we do expect to see, uh, or that we'll really be judging a lot in the in the coming quarter, is that uh, kind of that odd juxtaposition of the second derivative of turning in the U.S., but still expectations seem to us too low. Now you can quibble whether the ECFC uh, economic forecast for you know Q4 GDP in the U.S. of about half a percent are really what the you know the market is pricing in. Market's probably pricing in uh, you know a bit of a better outcome than that. But it's that juxtaposition of us. Okay, oh these temporary factors are going to be slowing growth in the fourth quarter. But even so, we we probably see growth coming in you know a bit ahead of that. How does the market deal with the the issue of the turn? Uh, versus continuing to be positive versus expectations. And um, we're, we're very aware, we're very cognizant of the idea that as you slow, as you turn, there are going to be points in this market where a it's going to be tough to tell whether you're heading for a soft landing or whether that deceleration continues and you're heading into something a, a little more severe of an outcome. Our view so far is what's shaping up in the fourth quarter is, is not going to be that latter, more negative outcome, but you know something we're definitely going to continue to monitor in the weeks to come. If yields stay where they are, can stocks keep doing well? This this is interesting because it's almost a it's a mirror of the question that you know we asked when we started the year. Can the economy handle a five percent potentially federal funds rate for the entire year? The view then for us was yes. The view then for us with stocks is that stability is really what's needed uh, much more so than yields coming down a lot for stocks to work. It's just that the negative momentum uh, in the in the bond market really does have to calm out. The positive momentum in oil prices really do have to cool a bit. And that cooling in the in the second derivative for rates in oil is going to be offset is going to be something that offsets that turn in the second derivative for U.S. growth and, and net out a little better for uh, risk assets is our view. Are you still bullish on China? Uh, we've been neutral on China for uh, a, a, a while now. I uh, hopefully we discussed last time, but it's just uh, in China it's the continued dichotomy between the fact that you know valuations are are very depressed. Right. It's not clear that there's a catalyst to to see higher, uh, faster growth in China. But when uh, the when risk assets in China are at this depressed valuation, uh, when they're this unloved by fund managers, that it's you know often a time where you get to see more meaningful moves to the upside. So a, a neutral view on China, but we're really counting mm -hmm. on their some of the piecemeal stimulus putting more of a floor under growth. Don't expect anything bigger from Chinese policymakers in the near term. Look, your charm is a student of the street. What's the bet on the street right now? Is there a massive short bet out there? I'd say the the bet on the street is continuously everybody knows what history says about buying the last Fed hike, et cetera, buying the end of cycle hike. Uh, I think the the big bet is also right now the the big worry. It's the idea that, you know, you Lisa talked about in the intro, just these other factors that were seeming to be pushing up yields. That's making the term premium argument. The most difficult thing about the term premium is no really nobody really understands <clears throat> it. We're all going to have very, very different definitions of it. But usually some of the things that people associate with term premium, they're going to correlate with how growth and inflation are moving. What's different this time is that you know, supply is moving much more counter cyclically, uh, sorry, much more pro cyclically than it has in the ca in the past. So that's something where you have this element of, of term premia that we typically come to have associated uh, as being associated with growth, with inflation that might yeah. be moving in a bit, bit different direction this time. And that's what I think, uh, you know, causes a, a bit of a scare to relying on your kind of traditional models right. for how and when to be adding a lot of duration. Lukawa, UBS, thank you so much for getting us started strong here. Uh, on a, a Monday. You know, Miriam Webster, thanks so much for watching in Springfield, Massachusetts. Miriam Webster emails in and says, what in God's name was that? <laughs> Bramos quinfecta. It's like a trifecta or a quadfecta, but I think it perfectly captures where we are. I think you nailed it, uh, Lisa. The quinfecta that we're in here is all the reasons not to participate. Well, I originally thought it was a quadfecta, but Luke Howe, I was grateful. I was grateful enough to him for making it a quinfecta. This is the issue. And we talk about toxic brew and we laugh. Yeah. But when you put certain things together, they <clears throat> take on a new meaning than if they were just taken in isolation. Right. And I think that's the reason why people are starting to feel like, hmm, maybe this time we're going to care a little bit more about a government shutdown in yeah. tandem with all the other factors. Our focus after London and the greater picture is market dynamics. Luke Kawa with us with UBS. Coming up, Katie Kaminsky, Alpha Simplex Boston. She is absolutely brilliant on the trend, the new trend, or is it a range? Stay with us. Futures at negative two. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I still believe 
If you shut down, you're in a weaker position. You need the time to fund the government while you pass all the appropriations. So does that so mean you're going to try to push forward with a Republican CR still? I would like to. You need to. He is the beleaguered Speaker of the House, a gentleman from California, well Kevin McCarthy. Really interesting background from below the Imperial Valley, Bakersfield, California. Just a whole different story there of Republican uh, pol politics. And I just really can't say the moment we have Lisa over the weekend. There are various sundry people in the Keene House. And of course, we were in London. You know, vet bill I got home was mental. So <laughs> vet bill demanded we have an Arnold weekend. So I had to watch like five Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. And I put on for various people in the family the Arnold Schwarzenegger speech at the 2004 Republican convention. It might as well have been from Venus or Mars compared to what McCarthy's putting up with today. Does Beth Bill drink California. martinis while he no, no. requests he likes, Arnold Schwarzenegger? He, he, gets the, he gets the olives, though, and there's no question <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm about wondering. that. The McCarthy is beleaguered as Schwarzenegger never was. We're going to do a market check, and we're going to get to this, and this is a shutdown in this week. Lisa knows when the shutdown occurs. I have no clue. Red and green on the screen here. A little churn of the tape within the Bramo Quinfecta of tension. Yields say it all. Lisa, comment on a... 4.49% 10-year yield. Wow. Well, Luke picked up on this, right? This is being driven by something ambiguous. It's not that inflation expectations are going up. It's not that growth expectations are going up. Is this something else, whether it's people protesting the budget and all of that? Is it because <clears throat> of that? Or is it simply because the Federal Reserve is selling bonds. They are not the buyer of last resort in the same yeah. way. And it's the same with the ECB. And this is a game changer in a very unusual cycle. And that, I think, is something a lot of people are picking up on. We're going to watch this very carefully as Global Wall Street greets the week 2.12% in the 10-year real yield curve disinversion. We'll get to that with our economists here in a moment. We need to jump now to one of a set of series of interviews we're going to do to brief you on a shutdown of the federal government of the United States of America. It is different than many other processes, debt, deficit, budget shortfall, and all the other fancy words only Anne-Marie Horton uh, understands. Briefing us on Washington's from Strategus, it's a Baird company, Jeanette Lowe, Director of Policy at Research. Jeanette, you got a 75% odds on shutdown. What will you listen for today or tomorrow to change your odds to calibrate a government shutdown? Well, good morning. So we won't have Congress really start to work on any of the potential bills until tomorrow. So that is where we're going to start to see the process really develop. Our anticipation is that the Senate is going to move first. They are going to try to put forward a short term continuing budget resolution. So that will keep the government funded for potentially a month, two months, up to three months into early December. And then they're going to send it over to the House. The House then has to decide do they have the votes to potentially pass that CR, even if it's with changes? Or does McCarthy have to then move with the Democrats to try to pass this? Or does he allow the government to shut down? So we're going to be listening to the rhetoric that we hear within yeah. the House. You have heard a lot of Republicans over the past week been frustrated by the handful of conservatives who have blocked any movement. And so as that chorus might change, we may be able to see this potential change that we okay. won't hit a government shutdown if they're willing to work with Democrats. Asking for a friend, Bramma went into Morristown on the Gulf Stream. She took the Gulf Stream back from London. I had to go through EWR. If there's a shutdown, is the border check customs lines worse than they were when I came back to two days ago? So that is always the risk. And there's been already some thoughts about, you know, you have to be careful that you might see more uh, more delays at, at the border um, and at the airports. They do have an essential uh, component to a shutdown. So anything that is deemed essential should still be in operation. But as we've seen oh, in shutdowns in the past, if you're showing up to work and you're not being given a paycheck, sometimes people don't actually show up. And so that's where we've seen some issues in the past with FAA and, and um, you know, transportation screening and all the like. This is a maddening issue, Jeanette. There are going to be 800,000 workers, including people who are military, people who are teachers, people, the rank and file, who do a lot of the work in the country, who are not going to be paid as there is this shutdown. And this comes at a time that's fragile, right? How much is this really going to end up being a political tit for tat 
where uh, Democrats count on Republicans as gaining sort of the brunt of the blame for this. And how much is this going to be something larger that leads to an economic slowdown that leaves both parties with egg on their face? Yeah, so we've seen in the past, looking historically at the shutdowns that have occurred, and there's been quite a few over the past number of years, in general, they do not have a major economic impact. So you do have people who are furloughed, they are not receiving paychecks, but generally shutdowns last on average eight days, the government reopens, that fill is then paid back, um, there's retro pay, and so everything kind of is filled in to some extent. So there hasn't really been a large economic impact. The last six shutdowns occurred in quarter with positive economic growth. The issue this time is that we are also now seeing, you know, the auto strike that is occurring. We're seeing inc increasing mm. pressures on consumers from student loan repayments, higher oil prices. You continue to have, you know, the Fed has higher interest rates and that is leading to higher debt issuance in the U.S. So these things are also putting a strain on the U.S. economy. And so the longer the shutdown lasts, that's where the issues really become into play. If we look back at the 2013 shutdown, that one lasted 16 days. Um, so that was, a, you know, it, it, two weeks is a long time, but it's not as long that it has as big of an impact um, as you might think. And so if we have something about the same time period, then that wouldn't be that um, egregious to the economy overall or to the stock market. But what we do have to think about is how does the government reopen? And usually there is political pressure that starts to kick in that then forces the hand of policymakers to actually get back to this. This one actually could end up being shorter or it could end up being longer. And the longer it lasts, I think the more risk there is to the economy, to the markets. And the other thing we're yeah. kind of watching out for is, is there something like Moody's could start to put the U.S. on credit watch if this lasts particularly long because the credit agencies have been more focused on process rather than even the U.S. finances and those decisions. Amid all of this, President Biden is heading to Detroit on Tuesday to join the picket line. It is the first time that a sitting president has joined strikers going back, I believe, more than 100 years. What is the significance that the focus is all going to be on Detroit rather than Washington, D.C. amid this shutdown? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that obviously for Biden too, this is if there is a shutdown, there is obviously a political uh, price to be paid. But Biden actually could have an opportunity here to improve his standing um, and actually show that he's trying to work to have the government reopen. But I think right. the fact that there is a lot of pressure on the auto workers is also trying to highlight, at least from Biden's perspective, a little bit about the impact that All this right. could have on the election, I mean, on the economy. And so that's going to be really important ahead right. of these decisions, because unfortunately, we're probably not going to know whether or not we're going to shut down or not until about Friday or Saturday, right as the deadline hits. Jeanette, help me here. And, and you know, I I just listened to you very carefully on the path of a shutdown. If it's eight or nine days and everybody gets retro pay, et cetera, why are we doing this? So this is usually about making a point. So if we look back at the 2013 shutdown, that was really a shutdown that occurred because uh, the Republicans were looking to block funding for the Affordable Care Act that was going into it, implementation at that time. This is a now an argument about saying we want lower spending and we want something done about what's happening at the southern border. And so usually the people in Congress feel that doing a shutdown will allow them to get their message across. It has not been particularly successful. They do not necessarily win concessions. And in fact, this time, if we look at what might ultimately happen, we can see where the bipartisanship is in Congress that we're going to have a spending deal. It's going to be higher spending than the conservatives want. And they're the ones who are pushing for this shutdown. And they have to see whether or not they're going to have leverage to actually get something done on the border, which is ultimately what they want. So shutdowns have not been particularly useful political instruments. They do not get much of a point across. They kind of allow people to get their frustrations out. But then we have to go back to governing. Now, that can be a positive outcome that we've kind of flushed out some of the frustrations within both members and both parties in Congress. But then you have to reopen the government and you have to start right. governing again. And that actually can be a positive outcome that comes out of this. Jeanette Lowe, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. We're going to continue to monitor this. I need to tell you about balance of power, a very focused attention on what we see going on in Washington. Joe Matthew, Amory Horton, uh, Kaylee Lyons helping out as well. Balance of power. Look for that in the early evening each and every day. Holger Schmieding, Berenberg, next.
Sunday on radio and television. Thank you for joining us. Thrilled at the anecdotal evidence that was discerned in London about a global audience. We're thrilled you're with us around the world and awaking America is well. We do a data check here. Future's flat, I'm bored. No, I'm not. In the yield space, <laughs> volumes are being spoken. 10-year real yield, a new level, 2.12%. What did you say, back to 2009? Yeah, March 2009. I just want to point out, okay, I every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, I am the person who looks at the Fed's balance sheet. It's just, and I've it's, been watching it, and it's fascinating. It's down now to about $8 trillion. Uh, the peak was about $9 trillion. So that so means we're more restrictive. It's about trillion of bonds that they have allowed roll off. How much is that the underestimated story behind the real yields continuing to climb when it is a global quantitative tightening? It's an overlay, and I look at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, 10 ratios. You don't have to memorize it. There's not going to be a quiz. It's become a little more restrictive in the last Thanks. three or four days as well, 0.19%. Uh, really not restrictive, but not the accommodation that was confounding uh, Chairman Powell uh, earlier. One other quote, as Lisa mentioned earlier, Brent crude rounded up $94 a barrel. We are over the Atlantic Ocean flying in, doing circles over White River Junction, Vermont for an hour, Not that two you're hours. I was like, are they going to run out of gas? All I want to get to run out of gas. I'm glad we're I'm glad we're looking at Mount Katahdin under surveillance this morning. Lisa yeah. Bramlett. Well, what we were talking about is sort of the Midlands, right? And what's going to happen there this morning? We're watching President Biden, who's going to be joining the picket line in support of striking <laughs> UAW workers this week. He will be speaking from Michigan on Tuesday. This comes ahead of Wednesday. So on we'll Wednesday, does he go to Trump. the board meeting of Ford? Well, that's the question, right? The union is expanding its strike against automakers GM and Slantis, not Ford. They're being spared uh, against uh, the strike with the warehouse and distribution centers as the two sides continue to work on a new deal. I wonder how this is going to play. Is he picking sides at a time where auto manufacturers are getting subsidies from his policies with some of the electric vehicle makers? And then, oh, yeah, by the way, former President Donald Trump is going to be there on Wednesday instead of right. going to the uh, the right. debate that's going to be happening. To me, the, 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 and John was very good about John. You remember John? I do. Farrell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. John was very good about this. He's on assignment in uh, England, by the way, folks. He Somebody is. said it was an Arsenal Tottenham, and I said, yeah, I think so. He actually has a very cool project. But, but we'll talk he's about got a later. project going on post Arsenal Tottenham, and his huge success with Daniel uh, Levy, really making global uh, newsways there. And, and Lisa, what was so cool there, to John's point, is any of this environmental stuff feasible? Is it economically feasible? And that's a whole side project into Q4. Is it economically feasible yeah. on the time frame that they're talking about? And this is with the whole Rishi Sunak London kind of flavor where he's pushing back and actually delaying it. Yeah. The other thing that we're focusing on is, as you pointed out, uh, this resolution Baby, the Hollywood writers strike may be coming to an end. You could see the move in Disney and Netflix this morning. The WGA and major movie and television producers announced a tentative deal late Sunday night. The new agreement is expected to lift pay and create new rules around artificial intelligence. Meanwhile, the <clears throat> screen actors strike still ongoing. Right. This to me, the changes in technology underpinning some of the angst fueling these strikes is something we cannot talk enough about, I think, Tom. So if you go down to the University of Texas and get a graduate degree in screenwriting, it's lifetime employment. That's what this agreement's about, right? Oh, I, I don't know the contours a, of the specific. Of, well, um, <laughs> she can read the details and then come on and we can Very interview good. her. But well, I am curious about well. that. What else you got? The EU's chief trade negotiator warning China that the bloc will ramp up pressure on fair trade. I find this fascinating. Valdis Tombrovsky, executive vice president for the European Trade Commission, uh, for the European Commission, made the comments. He's in China right now. He said the EU welcomes competition. It makes our company is stronger and more innovative. However, competition must be fair, and we will be more assertive in tackling unfairness. Early this month, of course, the EU did talk about uh, some sort of new probe into Chinese subsidies for electric vehicles. But this yeah. trip in China by Valdis Dombrovsky is very interesting at a moment that is pivotal for European-China relationships. In particular for Germany, it was interesting for London to see the distance between Berlin, Frankfurt, Bonn, and London. Uh, as well. Uh, with a voice on this, picking up the debris of our London uh, trip, is Holger Schmieding, his chief economist at Berenberg, and has been incredibly perceptive about this uh, linkage of monetary and fiscal economics in Europe and China. Which is really a key question at a moment of flux. 
And Holger Schmieding, I would love to get your opinion starting on what we were just talking about, which is this trip of all these Dombrovskis over in China. What is the likely outcome to some of the rhetoric that is increasingly hardline out of European leaders? Well, the likely outcome is clear. Germany, the European Union, is reducing its dependence on China. De-risking is the word, not decoupling. But the message from Dombrovsky is clear. We are serious about this. And in a way, we are self-confident in Europe. Yes, we do have some economic problems, but China probably has economic problems that are worse. We are the bigger market than China. We, the European Union, yeah, don't have to just accept what China does with subsidies, with its distortions. We can push back. Well, is there a sort of a tacit acceptance of slower growth or even recession during this transition process away from really depending on trade with China? There is a tacit acceptance, yes, that of course the de-risking with China will mean some short-term losses. It also is an acceptance that yes, if we want to be less dependent on China in the long run, an economy, China, that is actually struggling and will likely continue to struggle for quite a while, it means we get less boost out of foreign trade with China. But having said that, the lesson we've learned from Putin is clear. If you're too dependent on somebody whom you don't fully trust, you may eventually pay a heavy price for that, so it's probably worth de-risking now with modest near-term pain in order to secure a longer-term, fairer, more equal relationship with China. I, you know, the, the, one of the great cr uh, criminal acts in New York City is the Oak Room at the Plaza Hotel has been shut for, I think, 20 years. Absolutely ridiculous, beautiful, and historic room is, is, is well. Holger Schmieding, right now with dollar, day after day, up, 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 day after day, euro, down, 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 over nine, 10 weeks, whatever it is. Are we getting a distance to a Plaza Accord? How many kilometers are we from the discussion of a new Plaza Accord? I think we are quite far away from any discussion of that. So far, the move seems to be gradual. It's not disruptive. It seems to reflect that the US economy is holding right. up better than expected, whereas the Eurozone is kind of in stagnation. So as long as the currency moves gradually and does not right. seem to be fully out of kilter with fundamentals, I don't think we need a massive intervention. Come next year with the European economy picking up again, the Fed cutting rates sometime right. next year, and the ECB possibly not cutting rates, the euro will likely recover on its own. This is really, really important because a key thing there you said was we are not disruptive right now. Market participants feel we're disruptive. Uh, we're making jokes about a quinfecta, five different things we're bouncing off of right now. What is the policy, the best policy prescription for Lagarde and government leaders in Brussels? I think it's basically now <clears throat> stay the course. For monetary policy, okay, I think we've timed a bit more than we should have, but now the fairly clear message is we are probably at the peak, which has actually been, once it, when it came out, been sort of reassuring for right. markets. And for fiscal <clears throat> policy, I would say the same stay the course which largely means we have a big fiscal program in Europe, this next-gen EU program, which is now above 800 billion. The task is more to make sure the money is being spent, that is the rollout of the program, right. rather than thinking about any new money. Is Jerome Powell central banker to the world? Is Jerome Powell, whether we want to admit it or not, central banker to Europe? Not quite. Europe is not that dependent on the U.S. to really say so. For Europe, it really is Madame Lagarde, the central banker, that we have to, that we f uh, are glad to watch. Do you think that people are too bearish in Europe? Is that basically what I'm hearing from you? Um, not for the next few months. We are having a sharp inventory correction in manufacturing. We talked about China. The U.S. economy near term will probably be slowing down. So near term, trade export dependent, Europe is having trouble. But come next year, global manufacturing will pick up. The, manuf the inventory correction will be over. Next year, I think Europe could actually surprise here and there a bit on the upside. Will some of this slowdown and surprising negativity in Europe correct inflation? Our inflation doesn't have that much to do with domestic demand a bit. It, inflation is coming down largely because this big Putin shock on energy and food prices is largely fading. We have a bit of wage inflation to come to pass through for the next half year, but all in all, inflation in Europe is heading to probably around 2.5% by the second half of next year. 
Okay, but th this to me is really the dilemma, right? If it's not going to really lead to low inflation, if we're facing a stagflationary type of environment in Europe, how much is that the template that we're basically being forced to live with higher inflation, even with taking the pain of de-risking, even with taking the pain of recession, even with all of the other toxic brew of the quinfecta that we're talking about this morning? Well, stagflation is a description as to where we are now probably in Europe. We may see later this week already a fall in this inflation rate year over year into the 4% handle from a 5% handle, basically on base effects. And again, the big rise in energy, especially gas and electricity prices late last year, drops out of the comparison. Goods prices are stabilizing. I think that even without needing to constrain demand further, inflation will fall to around 2.5% by the second half of next year on its own. I look, Holger, at our trip to London, and I look back on how Europeans, the United Kingdom, how they perceive an America in disarray. How is it different this time? Well, it is a weird perception. On the one hand, we I marvel agree. that the U.S. economy is holding up better than expected despite the massive Fed rate hikes. But if we, and we find reasons for that, yes, consumers and mm -hmm. companies had good money to start with, yeah? But when we look at anything that comes close to U.S. politics, we basically shake our heads. Right. How is this going to end? Was there another talk of a government shutdown? Yeah, We've had that so often, yeah. it's kind of <laughs> yeah. ouch. By yeah. those standards, we think European politics, especially the ones in Brussels, actually, are not working It's badly. running like a Swiss watch. <laughs> yeah, Good luck exactly. leaving JFK. Yeah. Holger Schmieding, thank you so much, uh, with uh, Berenberg. And on that tune, Greg Villiers published this this morning. He's been such a support of Bloomberg surveillance. And Lisa, it's really simple. He frames out the McCarthy options, and Villiers says this could be a crisis, quote, well into winter. I find that sobering. It's one of ideology more than practicality. And that is yeah. something that people have talked about because even if some of the desires of the holdouts goes in into effect, the deficit is only going to decline slightly because it's really just a small package of cuts not affecting social mm -hmm. security payments and some of the other <clears throat> major uh, elephants in the room that a lot of lawmakers say need eventually to be deal with, dealt I with. I mean, it's as Churchill said in St. Louis a few years ago, somehow we get through it all and get it done. Where will you be October 2nd? Where will we be October 3rd? It's going to be interesting to see, uh, to say the least. You see the poll this weekend? Which Washington one? Washington Post, ABC. Which They've one? They've got Trump 80% ahead of Biden or whatever the number is. And it was such an odd poll. It speaks to modern polling. I think we've been very good about being suspect about that. That even ABC, Washington Post came out and said, we're really not sure about our polling. Honestly, I think it's so was. early. I feel like I'm channeling Tom Keene. Yeah. So early, how can we know anything from these polls? I'm really curious no. to see who's gonna actually be in the running. I mean, to me, the bigger question is gonna be, you know, do you end up with the Virginia governor as the front leader of the Republican Party? Do you end up with a different candidate for the Democrats that's come, right. that comes to the fore? I think that's increasingly the discussion of, is this really the field that's gonna make it to the end? Into the Republican debate, I believe it's Wednesday. We'll have coverage of that across all of Bloomberg and as well. Futures, well, there was a tone here hours ago that they were up, up, and then they were down, down off of China news. We'll get to that. Futures negative six right now, down futures at negative 35. Uh, VIX getting out to an 18 level, that's important, 17.98. The, the VIX, you know, 14, 13, life is good, and we ease back. We'll do the drawdown for you here in a bit, but 2.12% on the 10-year yield permeates the American financial experiment. That'll be interesting uh, to watch. Brent crude, 93.44, up fractionally this morning. Gold, 19.43, the ounce. Lisa Bramlitz and Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell <clears throat> on assignment. It was a draw. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. We can and will go all out if our national leadership decides the companies aren't willing to move. Stellantis and GM in particular are going to need some serious pushing. All of the parts distribution facilities at General Motors and Stellantis are being called to stand up and strike. Sean Fain, inch by inch, mile by mile, factory line by factory line. 
leading a strike at the UAW, Sean Fain, president of the UAW. That on Friday, which seems distant on Stellantis and Generous Motors as well. Lisa, this is for real. 38 new plants, none of yeah. them being Fords. What did Ford do right that GM and Stellantis are What they did to right do? is they agreed to negotiate. They walked in the room in Dearborn and they said, we're different. And I would also point out they didn't go bankrupt, which I think is a heritage issue here on a seismic shift to the UAW of the time of Steve Ratner, the car czar, and the restructuring of American uh, manufacturing. All of that's great. Quick market check here. We did one before. Why do one now? 2.12% uh, on the 10-year yield. That's a huge deal on the real yield. Uh, that's life-changing for all of us. 93.53 on Brent crude. I got a little bit of red on the screen. The VIX nearing 18 at level. There's some tension in your markets on Monday morning. Right now, joining us, following us across the Atlantic Ocean, Lisa had the Gulf Stream. Craig Trudell and I had to fly conventional. That was a nightmare. Joining us now, running all of our auto coverage, Mr. Trudell, of course, in Bloomberg, on his way to Detroit. I want to rip up all the discussion about the strike and understand that Eisenhower or Kennedy or LBJ didn't join the picket line. Mm. To me, this is a huge deal. Biden will pick it. Am I wrong? There's, there's been a, a lot of question about that. And I think the fact that the UAW uh, went from, you know, being in no hurry to invite him to inviting him is, is really fascinating. And the fact <clears throat> that, you know, when it surfaced that Trump had plans to go uh, visit workers, uh, the union very clearly gave him a sort of brushing off and, and uh, a, a sort of you're, you're not welcome here uh, message. So uh, the politici politicization of, right. of everything is, is coming to cars in ways we haven't seen before. Is Gina Raimondo, the Secretary of Commerce, a governor of hugely labor-centric Rhode Island, is she going to drop by Dearborn and have a, you know, Nescafe or a Sanka? What, what is the Secretary of Commerce, how does she respond to her president? Well, it will be interesting sort of where the lines are drawn here. I do think, you know, at, at the sort of factory level, we have our, our reporters in, in Detroit have been speaking with uh, workers on the picket lines about their sort of level of, of comfort or lack thereof with Biden joining them uh, in, in these uh, actions. I think they are a little bit wary of, of Biden uh, because of what happened with the rail strikes, the fact that he sort of inserted himself there. That being said, you know, this is a, a president who, uh, you know, calls himself the most pro-union president in history, uh, absolutely has, has uh, you know, made no bones about the fact that he wants to get behind uh, the, the labor movement in the U.S. Uh, and ab absolutely is, is sort of, you know, putting money where his, his mouth is in terms of, you know, uh, freeing up uh, IRA f funds, uh, the, the way that he was trying to structure that law uh, before uh, before it, uh, it it was passed uh, to actually benefit union made EVs, he wasn't able to get that done. But uh, nevertheless, it is you know very much going out of his way to, to boost labor in the U.S. in the auto sector. Let's build on that. There was a really awkward moment on Face the Nation over the weekend with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, mm. the representative from New York who bought a Tesla during the pandemic and had to talk about how it wasn't union made and try to square this circle that the Democrats are kind of facing, which is they want to put forward electric vehicles, but it's not benefiting some of the constituents that they want to really say they represent. How much do you feel that angst and reconsideration in the policies that you hear out of the, wash, uh, out of the White House? I think it, it's really interesting, uh, the, the, the fact that, that uh, Ocasio-Cortez, by the way, I should mention, uh, has, has said before that she was looking to trade in her Tesla. So I think this is a sort of, you know, uh, long, uh, long in the works uh, sort of, you know, move away from Elon Musk on the part of some, some members of Congress in, in Washington. Uh, but a absolutely it's the case that uh, the, the union was not making a ton of electric vehicles until very recently. And for the most part, the, the cars that they are making that are electric are on the, on the higher end side, you know, Cadillacs and uh, big pickups and, and, you know, pretty expensive vehicles that you wouldn't necessarily see, uh, you know, foresee an AOC uh, in necessarily. I think we're going to see that change in the next few years in a pretty significant way. Uh, we, we, you know, maybe the lone exception in terms of the Detroit 3 making a sort of cheap electric vehicle has been the Chevrolet Bolt. And they haven't really made those in, in very significant numbers, in part because the demand has not necessarily been there. 
but we're seeing a, a huge movement on the part of General Motors and Ford in particular uh, to try and move uh, down the, the price scale and, and bring electric vehicles to more of a, a mass market and follow Tesla into that. Let me put it this way. How much is President Biden considering doing what Rishi Sunak did last week? Mm. This idea of pulling back from some of the more ambitious goals to roll out electric vehicles in the United States. I think it's more of a case of, of the U.S. Uh, I, I do think we have to sort of, you know, call strikes here. The U.S. is far behind in making the electric vehicle transition that, that yeah. Europe has been making for several years now. Uh, there's a lot of concern in Europe lately about the fact that the IRA is, is really, uh, you know, going to make an effort to significantly change that. You want to talk about anti-subsidy investigations that the EU just launched against, launched against China. Uh, the amount of money flowing into this sector, uh, not only on the consumer side, obviously there's a lot of attention oh. on $7,500, but a lot into the manufacturing sector, and that's leading to huge investments. And so uh, there, there's a right. real effort to play catch up here and for the unions to, to sort of you know, uh, come along right. in that journey. I want to make clear, folks, this is the Bloomberg advantage. We've got the team, Keith Naughton and all in Detroit. They're not in speaking terms with Trudell, but that's a different story. We've got <laughs> Craig in London looking at the global EV market. And what I learned in London, way ahead of us on all this chit chat in Europe and China, is that we've got China, 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 and we go back to Don McLean, American Pie, and we got a Chevy going over the levee, but the levee's dry. <laughs> Not good, okay. So what does Chevy do over the levee to compete against China? That's the heart of the matter. It's, it's, I do think that one of the interesting things that we're seeing is a, an attempt to kind of, you know, go from uh, a, a global industry to uh, kind of battening down the hatches and bringing, bringing manufacturing Are we to build, regions. Stop, stop. Let's cut to the chase. Are we going to build American non-union EVs in South Carolina, or are we going to try to build a $40,000 fake cheap EV in Dearborn? I think we're, we're going to try and build a lot of Chevys uh, in, in, uh, in General Motors plants that have been making combustion engine cars. I think we're also going to see new plants go up in the south, interestingly, from some of these uh, Detroit companies. So you see Ford making big investments union? in Tennessee and Kentucky. That is the big question and the big rub of, of these union negotiations. Is that in the negotiations right now? I, th I think uh, in terms of the electric pickup that they're going to make in the right. South, I would be shocked if that isn't a unionized plan. Lisa. But in terms of the, the, the battery manufacturing, right. that is the big rub because these okay. are joint ventures between Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis and companies that are not necessarily unionized and, and have little desire to be unionized. And down in the South, when they're down doing the union South. or non-union, they'll be drinking whiskey and rum. Okay, can I just tell you, my favorite part of every day is when you ask a question like that, and then the guest has to answer completely seriously without laughing, and with you about to break into song. This started? Seriously, you know this started? that's my favorite part of the day. Uh, we could do this with Craig. Craig has been a huge value add for us. I'll take 30 seconds here. Lisa, jump in here when I'm talking too much. We're in radio. We're inventing Bloomberg surveillance with John Farrell. That in itself was overtime at work. And I started, he's going out about Africa or something. Uh -huh. And I start in with the lyrics of Toto. Uh -huh. And John's yeah. looking at yeah, me yeah. like, what have yeah. I got myself? <laughs> Go. Well, honestly, it's just my favorite. I just want to finish up with, how close are we to some sort of resolution? Are we hunkering down for this lasting a very long time? I think we got a positive m message from Sean Fain last week about some progress on the part of, of Ford and the union, but I don't think that we necessarily have the details from his comments to really have a, a strong sense of just how close right. the union and this company are. My, my bet is that, uh, that this will continue uh, probably for several more weeks, and uh, the folks in Dearborn are just hoping that we don't see any setbacks and, yeah. and sort of a feeling of a bad faith on the part of the union that prolongs, not only prolongs this strike, but results in, I, in the union adding to addi adding additional Ford plants to the For strike. fossils like me, I'm just it's, it's simple. This this Biden walking the picket line is just stunning. It's, it it's I, hasn't been seen for be a I wonder years. if I'm overplaying this or underplaying this. No question. We don't know if he's gonna be doing that though yet at this point. Oh we don't know. We yet. don't know if he's gonna be walking the picket line. Oh I thought he we will did know be that. there oh, addressing okay. them, right? We don't know. I was exactly. just gonna say in Dearborn I hear the drums echoing tonight. Okay, honestly. I mean you're like the Chevy to the levee, but the levee is dry. Craig, right. what do you think did about you the levee being dry? Craig has to answer completely with Toto seriously. Look out great. Oh, Futures in negative two. The group says everybody put a cork in it. Stay with us. I Don't hope. change, Tom. Huh?
to digest higher rates for longer will take time. I don't think rates need to go any further than where they are today. It's not so much the level of the rates that's the problem, it's the adjustment. What's going on in markets is quite different to what's going on in the real economy. The economic soft landing narrative is definitely being challenged. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance on radio and television. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom King. John Farrell on assignment after a two to two draw uh, at Arsenal Tottenham. I watched the highlights. I did know, too, actually. I was, was trying to make know, sure I kept was up. Very good. Farrell recovering from that. We hope to see him maybe tomorrow because the golf stream's over here. So, you know, I, I think maybe. Okay, Wednesday. hold on. Let's just yeah. make this real clear right here. Yeah. I do not take a golf stream or a private plane because people Didn't have you? actually stopped okay. me and said, why are you not on a private I plane? I have never too. taken a private plane before in my I, life, but carry on. I was stopped in Heathrow about Lisa on the golf stream and said, well, the Bombardier we're looking at, but we just don't think we can <laughs> Terrible. pull that off. Futures in negative one, Dow futures negative 14. You're waking up on a Monday to a changed world. Bramo nails it with a Quinfecta idea of five or things in a swirl. Let's go to something we haven't talked about yet with the real yield up to your new highs, new generational highs, 2.11%. China, the developers, that story unravels to the point I think I can say there's no bid in the market because there's no market. There is a feeling that something could happen where there could be a real default and suddenly there is a difficult scenario that the government can't control or is unwilling to control in a meaningful way. We talk about the quinfecta and that includes real yields. It also includes the auto strikes. It also includes a government shutdown. It also yeah. includes uh, this idea of higher gas prices at a time where oil prices are rising yet again today. And you put that together and it's oh. very hard to see how any of them, yes, maybe in the in uh, in isolation, not that significant. You put them together, yeah. it feels different. It's like Craig Trudeau and the EV vehicles. Well, who cares? Nobody can afford them but the rich people. I'm going to look at the housing market where nobody can afford to do housing except the rich people. And while you and I were sojourning in London, uh, you know, I thought, you know, it, I wasn't in Mayfair. I was west of Mayfair a little mm. bit looking at you know, uh -huh. a closet. Bank rate 30, 7.75%. Rounded up. How close are we getting? to an 8% mortgage. At a time where perhaps not a lot of people are paying for them, uh, for that kind of <clears throat> mortgage rate, because you can see that the housing market's basically broken. On the other hand, right. it highlights how expensive things are getting. Mark Zandi of Moody's over the weekend so you put did this that. out. Yes, and I he said that. it costs $734 more each month that is thousands of dollars a year each month to buy the same goods and services as it did two years ago for the average median household in the United States. You start looking at that, you understand some of the dissatisfaction. You understand why people are less concerned about the pace of the disinflation right. and are still looking at just outright inflation and making a lot more discretionary choices with we've, their buying. We've got a guest on this in the market dynamics. If you're part of Global Wall Street, Catherine Kaminsky will join us here in a moment. Shall we brief? Let's brief because this has to do with the entire week ahead and really framing out this discussion of real yields climbing to the highest levels or about the highest levels since 2009. Seven Fed speakers. Tom is on the mm. edge of his seat waiting to hear them all. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, that is today at 6 p.m. Fed Governor Michelle Bowen tomorrow, Thursday, the Fed Bonanza. Fed Chair Jay Powell, Fed Governor Lisa Cook, Chicago Fed President Oscar Goolsby, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin on Friday. We hear from New York uh, Fed Reserve President. President John Williams, really key to hear anything on real yields. Earnings, and this to me, it kind of speaks to the same story, Tom. How much do people keep buying if you get their overall expenses continuing to climb? We get earnings on Tuesday from Costco, Wednesday H&M, <coughs> yeah. Thursday is Nike. How much are we looking at a new pressure on consumer discretionary that well, start feeling it first. This is nominal. You, you sales of all this is done in nominal, including Mike McKee's retail sales number. And I usually don't pay attention to this. And I think you're dead on. This time around, the retail pulse is a huge precursor to what we see beginning October 13th with JP Morgan. Anecdotally, we hear people pulling back. When do we start to see that in the granular earnings data on the Luxury overall economic the data? Yeah, exactly. Luxury Again, hammer. it's just why would people spend that if they're spending so much and everything else? Mm -hmm. Economic data this week, home price data, as well as the new home sales that comes out tomorrow. I'm curious if anything's moving, considering the fact that this is basically a broken market. Jobless claims Thursday. And to me, the key day of the week is Friday personal income and spending, as well as core PCE data. Again, how much do we see the economic surprises continue to inflect upward in a U.S. that is seeing this confecta, quinfecta? 
Quinn of, factor. of threats, Five. this toxic Five. brew of feeling it's, that maybe it's, it's getting yeah. difficult. Hex factor? What's hex, that? Six. Six. Yeah? Seven. What do yeah. you think Hex factor Engineering. is? Like what? You know. Vet Bill having a martini? Yeah. No, we didn't have that. But, you know, <laughs> again, he has the olives. We've cut them off. You know, <laughs> they're trying to cut me off, too. I'm going to focus on the VIX 17.84. If you're part of Global Wall Street, arguably this is the conversation of the day. Catherine Kaminsky, and the title's boring, Chief Research Strategist at Alpha Simplex. But far more importantly, out of the Andrew Lowe combine in MIT Boston, is trend-based. She and her shop follow trends in the probability of coming out of a range into some trend across all assets like nobody on the street. Katie Kaminsky to brief us this morning. Katie, I'm going to be honest here. You correlate across some bonds, ec economics and all that, over to equity markets where you are more uh, than tentative. Tell us about the repricing that we could see in the equity markets. Good point. Okay, so this year what we've really seen is that the equity market has been disjointed from the fixed income market. So it's been blissfully going along relatively positively, ignoring the fact that there might be some issues and we might need to have higher rates for longer. We feel like last week we finally saw a point of recognition. We saw a breakout in the fixed income market where we saw yields higher significantly on the long end. What this means is the market has really finally said, wait a minute, right. these upside risks are real. Like higher energy prices, that's a challenge. I mean, these things have to be solved for the equity market to to waver through this. And now we go where the pros fear to tread. Wells Wilder, 1978, with Katie Kaminsky. Katie, cut to the chase. There's a green equity feel of up, 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 and a red down, down, down from Wells Wilder called ADX DMI. It's a toxic soup of calculus as well. What are you learning right now from a broader S&P or NASDAQ 100 ADX DMI available only on the Bloomberg terminal? Well, if you look at most of the technical signals right now, they all are pretty consistent. The equity has been relatively positive, but a little more tentative recently. But if you look at fixed income, I mean, let's be honest, fixed income is actually set to have two years in a row of negative returns. And fixed income signals have been consistently short for months and working well, particularly this month. We've seen energy breaking out more recently. And then we've seen in the currency basket, we've seen the dollar trade also being one of the stronger ones in the last two months. So, so we're really seeing last year repeating itself. So is so, that what you're leaning into? Yeah. I mean, that's my question is, are you basically doubling down on your bond bear thesis and doubling down also on oil prices going higher? Or are you seeing this starting to reach a top, a topping point that makes you pull back? This is a good question, Lisa, because we're not really in the business of picking tops and bottoms. But what we are doing is following where market themes are moving and what people are actually doing. And what people have been doing all year, which has confused me, is sold bonds but said that they liked them. So it's it's really sort of this weird dichotomy. And so what we're seeing as well is we're seeing continued acceleration in the bond market on the short side, not more than before. So I wouldn't say that we're seeing more short positions. We're just seeing a consistent view. Although we've seen somewhat of a bottom at the short end of the curve. So remember in earlier this year, we saw the short end of the curve bottom to some degree. We've been looking for more of a bottom on the long end of the curve. So when are long-term rates going to sell off or long-term bonds? And that's exactly what we saw last week. And that was our point of recognition where the market said, wait a minute, you're right, maybe we have to be higher for longer and we need to disinvert the curve. And that's finally starting to happen. Katie, I was struck by maybe people capitulate just ahead of the market actually turning their way or the economy turning their way. And it feels like a market that wants to inflict the most pain on the greatest number of people as markets are wont to do. It feels like things are turning on the edges in ways that might challenge the bond bear thesis and how high yields can go. So is this a point where you start to reassess, this is the capitulation moment where things can start to normalize in a more significant way. How much are you leaning into that? So what's interesting is we did a study last year, we studied the short bond trade. And empirically, if you look over different cycles of the markets during inverted yield curves, trend signals tend to work very well being short fixed income. During a flatter yield curve, it becomes more mixed. 
And as we see a steeper yield curve, then we tend to lean more into longer positions. So that's something we've been kind of monitoring and thinking about over the last year yeah. is this concept of we need to find that inflection point. And since we now have a much flatter yield, look at that 10 year today. It's close to four or five. That's pretty flat. Um, and so as we see that flattening and disinversion, right. that means that we're going to see more of that inflection point closer to the bottom of the bond market. What you just heard there, folks, is gospel from Katie Kaminsky. I can't say enough about disinversion and the point of a tip point, if you will, an emotional point. To pick up on that, Katie, I'm looking at the Bloomberg uh, Total Return Treasury uh, Index. You know it. We're back to 2016 pricing. You mentioned two years of negative return in the bond market. For the pros out there, on bills, on notes, on bonds, do, do they have gamma-like equities? Is there an emotion there where if we break through certain support levels on price, go lower in price, higher in yield, that you get so-called gamma or the emotion get me out? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's part of what we've seen recently is at a certain point, you have that aha moment. We had that in short term bonds earlier this year when people realized so people would focus on the shorter end of the curve. But I think right now you're hitting that moment where people are saying if inflation is higher for longer, longer term cash flows will be exposed more to that particular pressure. And even if we have higher yields, yield, you know, higher real yields plus inflation is a nominal rate. So we have to have higher nominal rates until yeah. we deal with the problems. And the problems are higher oil prices, inflation not going down. It's yeah. dealing with supply chain issues and other things that we just didn't have in a low interest rate world. A clinic, Katie, thank you so much. 4.49% right now on the 10 year yield she was quoting. Catherine Kaminsky with Alpha Simplex uh, this morning. You know, I just, you know, Monday, we're, Luke Kawa was doing Newtonian calculus way too early in the morning. I just got to know, Qantas hates when I do Greek. Okay. You know, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Omicron, <laughs> there Epsilon. Was, there was a, tech, he hates this. a techno song that my oldest son listened to to remember all the Greek letters. And so that's all that's I can cool. think of. It was like alpha. That's, well, you should memorize Delta. your Greek letters as well. Katie Kaminsky there. That's a clinic for Global Wall Street. The Standard & Poor's 500 this morning, uh, I'm going to call it down one-tenth of a percent. So what are you looking at most this week? I mean, for me, I think Good actually, question. I, I really question. think that retail sales in the, in the United States might be the most interesting part, especially paired with earnings. What about you? I mean, I, I think the earnings play into it because that's the hope and the prayer of the soft landing is earnings resiliency. What I got China and I'm underplaying the gloom there. I could be wrong on that. But what am I watching? I, I, I think it's got to be the real economy, uh, you know, the, the parlor game, the Fed, the mumbo jumbo, less important now than, OK, what does Nike do? How bad is it in all the different earnings? I would agree there. with that. I don't think that the yeah. Fed speak is really going to have as much of a, a feature in market yeah. response. I think people have moved beyond it and they're looking at the granularity. But this might be the last data that we get before government shutdown removes all of the public data. I mean, the retail sales of the PCE, the core PCE on Friday, might be some of the last nuggets of information that we get from the official channels. I'm just going to go back to the real economy, which is nominal GDP. What does it mean for revenues and the margin, the shock we've seen of constructive margins? But the heart of the matter, and particularly waking up on a Monday and having Purvis come up with tall back is really important. The basic idea, Lisa, that we're going to go into earnings season and once again be surprised and everybody's going to pile into seven and a half stocks. That, to me, is what's not expected Maybe. here. Although, you know what? Or People are all buying going their down. the uh, iPhone 15, evidently, is crushing it. I, I, so maybe, maybe the Feral, last sighting of Feral, actually, was at Covent Garden. Um, he was in a line outside the Apple I store. love how you just, you know, project I do, on everyone. You know. Take the jet stream, spend the time in, you know, Apple stores, singing American Pie. negative four. Yes, the Bra we got a message. Is the Bramo Cam with us in our new studios? <laughs> yes, the Bramo Cam came with us. <laughs> This is Bloomberg. Stay with us. A government shutdown could impact everything from food safety to cancer research to Head Start programs for children. Funding the government is one of the most basic responsibilities of Congress. And it's time for the Republicans to start doing the job America elected them to do. President of the United States in for an active week. They're speaking to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation dinner on uh, Saturday. I would say largely a Democratic room. He will have to go to Michigan, which is fractious to say the least. 
of a Republican and Democratic state. One, one year, some, one wins Lisa, the next year the other one wins. Trump looks at that as fair ground. There's Which no is other way to put it. the reason why they're both going to be they're in gonna both be there. Detroit, in yeah. Michigan. And I'm curious who's going to gain more traction and whether that's going to take over any publicity from the potential government shutdown. Welcome, all of you. Good morning, Bloomberg Surveillance. We're in our temporary studios here in New York. A little bit different uh, look. Farrell with our interior designers in London. He's picking out curtains for the new studio. We're a building here. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keane with really interesting uh, markets. You need to stay with us through the morning here as we see if yield adjusts. Equities quiescent to say the least, although a VIX out to 17.90 shows a relative tension over, say, 14 days, maybe 10 Business days, 93.41 on Brent crude, 90 West Texas Intermediate. We got to go to the yield space, Lisa. I'm sorry to walk in and see 2.12% new high 10-year real yield. That shifts the game for any and all. How many days have we come in and thought that yields would come lower? and think that people were going to buy since everyone was yeah. saying that they were buying. And as Katie Kumisi said, said they were all selling, even though they said they were buying. To me, the key question is what's going to be more important this week? Is it going right. to be the government shutdown discussions or is it going to be what's going on in Detroit? Anne-Marie Hordern, fresh off UNGA, is back in Washington, D.C., our Washington correspondent for UNGA. Bloomberg. Anne-Marie, I'm curious, what's more important to you? What's going on with respect to the shutdown discussions or what's happening in Detroit? Well, I think when you put them together, that's when you have concerns for the U.S. economy. Even though shutdowns in the near term don't impact the U.S. economy, they do cost money in the sense that we are paying people to not work but still not collecting fees, say, at a national park. That can cost the U.S. government actually a fair amount of money. But to the consumer, there's not an intense amount of impact of a shutdown. But if you coalesce all these things together, as Stephanie Lowe said in, in your earlier hour, and you have higher oil prices that impact gas prices, you still have inflation, you have a government shutdown, and you have the auto workers striking, that could be very difficult for the U.S. economy. Obviously, in Washington, I'm laser focused on the shutdown because there's really not a lot of time to get this done. And you do see a lot of positions within the Republican Party feel to be um, that they're just hardening and it's just taking a lot longer. There wasn't a ton of movement this weekend. They'll be back in session tomorrow. And Speaker McCarthy wants to get four appropriation bills on the floor, potentially maybe um, coming together with the hard right to show some, an olive branch that he wants to do this by appropriation bills, not just a stopgap funding measure. And then maybe they would allow him to pass a stopgap funding measure. But at the end of the day, anything the House wants to get through, it's not going to work in the right. Senate. So there potentially could be a shutdown, at least for, as Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano say, 48 hours. And a lot of Democrats have been saying that maybe this could benefit Biden. A lot of the oxygen is being sucked out of the room. I was wrong earlier when I said it's unclear whether President Biden will join the picket line on Friday. He did put out a tweet Surveillance saying correct. an X, an X post, I will say. Uh, I'll go to Michigan to join the picket line and stand in solidarity with the men and women of the UAW as they fight for a fair share of the value they helped create. How awkward is this going to be? Will this be viewed as a victory politically for President Biden or a liability? Yeah, I'm looking at the president's week ahead schedule and in Tuesday it's there in black and white. Wayne County, Michigan is where he'll be to join the picket line. I mean, you had Pete Buttigieg out over the weekend saying the president should be doing this. He's standing with the American people. He's definitely being backed up by the Democratic Party to go join the picket line and go stand in solidarity with American workers. That's the tone from the Democratic Party. Um, obviously, there are concerns because they're in the middle of a negotiation with uh, the three big auto companies. And obviously, the president wants to see auto companies in America as they have this EV transition also prosper. So the president, I think, is just going to make a show to make sure that he is being seen as the most pro-labor union president yeah. in American history. He likes to tout it. And now he's really putting his money where his mouth is. Interesting, this factoid from The Washington Post this morning caught my eye. Labor experts say it's probably the first time a sitting president has visited a strike in at least 100 years. So it really feels like a paradigm shift. Right. Uh, Amory, I want to digress here for our international audience and frankly for Americans in an iPhone world. I am fascinated how blind Joe Matthew and Anne-Marie Horton are when looking at polls. We begin this political season and the New York Times sums it nicely here. You got an NBC poll you got an ABC Washington Post poll. They're not even close. There used to be this time where people in bow ties came out and said, and this is the way the poll is, plus or minus. It's gone. Do the polls matter, Anne-Marie, now that we're all living on cell phones? 
Well, I think the polls matter closer to an election. I think it's very difficult to look at these polls so far out. We're over a year away from the November 2024 presidential election. But it is quite astonishing when you look at this Washington Post ABC News poll, because if even um, a slight bit of it is true, the Democrats have a big problem. <clears throat> Trump is leading Biden by 10 percentage points in this poll. And if you dig a little bit deeper into the right. details of this data, under 35, Trump is leading with in voters aged under 35. Trump is leading by 20 percentage points. This is a group that Biden scored major wins with right. in 2020, leading by double digits. So, yes, at the moment, this is an outlier. Uh, but looking at this poll could potentially be concerning if a few other polls start to show up like this. Also within the data, one thing is very clear. Please. Americans continue to give this administration poor remarks on the economy, right. even though they tout Bidenomics and they tout the low unemployment right. rate. Inflation still seems to be this number one concern. So, so bring it over to Michigan. I mean, what is the prescription to get that under 35 vote in Michigan? Does everybody show up at a Nickelback concert? What do you do? What do you do in Michigan? <laughs> Nickel Nickelback. I don't even know if they're still performing, Tom. But yeah, I mean, I think, Amory, I think I priced President him. Amory, I priced him for a family outing. They want seven hundred fifty thousand dollars base fee. <laughs> Let's continue. Uh, I didn't realize the T the Keen households were big Nickelback fans. OK, good to know. Uh, I think this Michigan uh, trip, the president is going to try to shore up everyone in that state to show he's in solidarity with these workers, with these workers and their communities, right? So many of these UAW workers, uh, potentially their families also work on the supply chain that are impacted by what is going on. He wants to, the Democrats want to show we are on the side of workers, less so on the side of corporate America. This con administration continuously always touts as well the idea of corporate greed and a low corporate tax rate that they always want. Wanted, they, they've wanted to bring up um, after the Trump era tax cuts. That is his mission in Michigan. And why Michigan is so important is because, of course, Biden won it in 2020. But the former president, Donald Trump, was able to flip it in 2016. That was the first time since the late 1980s. And Maria, are we going to hear about the green agenda on Tuesday from President Biden? Oh, I highly doubt it. Unless he's asked about it, he'll say that they want to support a fair uh, transition to the green agenda where workers are the first ones from the UAW to potentially get those jobs. But he is not going to want to touch this industrial policy with the Inflation yeah. Reduction Act. Emery Horton, thank you so much. A terrific Monday brief. Hopefully she'll be here for the Tuesday brief um, as, as well. The news flow, just extraordinary. And I loved your question, Lisa, your insight about, OK, UAW strike or government shutdown, particularly if a shutdown is presumed to be eight days a week and Everybody gets paid at the end of it. Oh, we were pretending. I mean, I get to your point. If UAW is long like the Hollywood strike, that's maybe more important. Especially because you've got posturing from both President Biden as well as former President Trump in Michigan trying to get that vote at a time where it's unclear where the allegiance lies yeah. and what the main issues I mean, are that are, are driving it. We got the encyclopedia, Greg Giroux on this, expert at Bloomberg on, on all this. But I think Giroux would say, look, the election's only, there's 50 states last I knew. Yeah. It's only like 10 states or nine, you know, I don't know how many, nine states. The swing or, states that are most important. State. And this is one of them. And it's really the key issue, which is you talk about, or, and Marie was talking about how a lot of people grade Biden negatively with the economy. And it comes down to inflation. And regardless of inflation coming in, costs are going up at a really notable way. And real uh, wages just crossed where inflation was a couple yeah. of months ago. It's tough when you're looking at a fixed cost. Gas prices are rising. Your mortgage rates are crazy. Well, that's what it becomes feeling, a difficult yeah. moment. Everyone feeling that in uh, America. Right now, we're feeling a market check in order. Futures at negative four down, futures at negative 24. The VIX near an 18 level. The yield space speaks disinversion in place. Stay with us, Bloomberg Surveillance. Bloomberg Surveillance on radio and television. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Brown, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrow on assignment after Arsenal Tots draw. Interviewing Daniel Levy. That was hugely successful. That was hugely He was successful. back in a corner. They went down, you know. I mean, I mean, everybody's got an opinion of the game. I think Arsenal sort of didn't deserve to win, but... Oh, Neil, what a shocker. Neil, 
Neil Millington at the Lanesboro would say, no, I'm wrong. But the answer is, you know, Farrell was down in the corner with the Tots crew. This away game. And, mm. and uh, you know, I, I, he was up like 13 rows. He, he wasn't hugging players, but there he was. He was going mental. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, it's... It's great. He's on assignment in London, recovering. We look for him on Tuesday and or uh, Wednesday as well. Features negative four. Lisa and I are focused in the bond space, as they say, from bills out to bonds. Let's we'll do curve inversion right now. 62 basis points. So we're in from 80, 90 basis points. On radio, the hand check here is going to be uh, great here. Two-year, 10-year, and that's becoming less of a gap. We're disinvertingly. So what's that mean for the pros? Well, what Katie Kaminsky was just saying is that maybe that's the tipping point where you reach some sort of new reality when people start to understand yeah. maybe this is the level that we're going to live with for a longer period of time. And that's why you're getting that flattening. But honestly, I just think right, right now what Katie said Everyone's been saying that they're buying bonds, but they're all selling them. And at what point do we get some capitulation? That's fantastic. You know, and, to that? and a yield basis, like price, price down, yield up. That's where we're going here with a must-listen interview. Yeah, it's like ZZ Top in yeah. that video that they did <laughs> I'm just thinking years ago. Else. You know, we're gonna, we're, Eric Davis is going to join us in a moment. If you're with Global Wall Street, you've got to pay attention to this. He was hugely controversial last time. Uh, he was on 9351 on oil. We're going to go under surveillance led by the president of the United States. We're in Patagonia on the uh, picket line. Yeah, well, this is the concern uh, that some people have. What's the political stew that's going to take a precedence this week? President Biden warning Republicans of the risks of a potential government shutdown with the deadline now less than a week away. Republicans made little progress over the weekend on a short-term spending measure that would still need to pass through the Democrat-led Senate. Seems like it's increasingly likely there will be a shutdown. Unclear, though, Tom, whether the length will really justify its being its ranking among the quintuple threats that are facing markets right now. Well, it's good to see. And to me, the big thing is his story. As Anne Marie Horton said, he goes to Michigan, and after those polls that we saw this weekend, it's sort of a near-term. Let's go. Let's jumpstart this. But he's been trying to do that all through the summer. I mean, this is not a new project. I love what Holger meeting said. It's like you know, relative to the. U.S. right now. Europe seems like it's a well-oiled machine. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zentner saying it's highly unlikely the Fed hikes uh, rates yeah. in November. <clears throat> they think that they're done, Morgan Stanley. Instead, believing the Fed is done and expecting rate cuts to start in March of next year. Zentner tells the What Goes Up podcast, quote, they've got until the end of the year to decide if they're going right. to hike further <clears throat> and they've left the door open to hike further if needed. I have a strong view that they're done here, but they have left the door open. Basically talking about how the bar is incredibly high given that their baseline expectation is for a reacceleration slightly of inflation by year end. And this is really important because you dovetail Zentner's economics, Lisa, with what we see with Jim Karen a few days ago, applying it into the bond space. And this is the Morgan Stanley bet that this is it, price up, yield down at some point. There isn't conviction right now. This is yeah. very much uh, controversial and very much non-consensus, if you think about it. Because as Katie said, and I keep going back to this, everyone says they're buying bonds, but they're selling. And if you believe uh, Ellen Zentner, you'd be a bull, uh, a bull, uh, a, bo a, a bond bull. Excuse Nailed me, that. I'll get it out. Nailed it's that. incredible. So you know, thanks. <laughs> this to me is going to be really interesting. Uh, whether people start to lean into that, we'll have to see. You know, I don't. Everybody's going to have to rewrite this. Everybody's got to do their Q4 guesstimates on outlooks. I think it's as foggy as it was. What else do we have here? Delivery times for Apple's latest iPhone, the iPhone 15, which I know you're very excited about. Yeah, I think yeah. that Fat yeah, Bell's going to yeah, get one, too. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the lines to wait for Apple's cheapest iPhone 15 model are almost twice as long this year than its predecessor, signaling strong demand for the company's newest phone. Buyers waiting 10 days to receive the basic model up from six a year ago. Pre-orders for the iPhone 15 Pro Max increased to a record. Significant upgrades to both models are what some people say are driving demand. What I find interesting is this is even in China. It's not just in the U.S. And you wonder if maybe all of the regulations right. and the pushbacks of the Chinese authorities <clears throat> didn't really have the effect on people right. in the rank and file in China, the consumer, in terms of pushing them away from the iPhone. Thanks for the email. Thanks for watching and listening in London and particularly in Covent Garden. We just had a Pharaoh sighting. WC2E8HB, that's a zip code in London, and that's like the Apple store, I think, sort of in Covent Garden. He's down there 
picking up a new toy. This is hugely anticipated, and this is what Bloomberg surveillance is about. Our team is 24-7, and over the weekend, we said, get Catherine Kaminsky on the equity markets and get Earl Davis, had a fixed income at BMO Asset Management, on yield as well. Earl Davis joins us to bounce off what Catherine Kaminsky just said. Earl, you say price down, yield up. You have a greater conviction on that than the last time we talked. So here's the interesting thing. The answer is definitely yes. This is unfolding largely as we saw it, and we still see, you know what, uh, significant room for, for a sell-off on, on 10 to 30-year bonds, uh, you know, possibly 50 to 75 basis points higher before the end of the year on 10 to 30-year bonds. Having said that, we do see that as a buying opportunity. You know, Friday, we actually reduced our short position slightly, uh, not by buying nominal bonds, interestingly, by buying tips. We do see tremendous value in the tip market at a 220 real yield. Yeah. Uh, not to say it can't get cheaper, which we believe it will, but that's where we're looking to buy when we're reducing our short position. Well, two questions, one very short. Where does the 10-year real yield, where can that frame out from a 220? Does that have scope and scale teens weens out to 222, 225, or can it really jump out? It could really jump out to 250 to 3%. It was at 3% in, in, in 2008. Right. And let me explain the reason why. Uh, when the real yield goes up, investors obviously get a real return. And with the economy being so resilient and still being strong, you know, solid, as the Fed said, um, what they have to do is take uh, dollars out of the growth economy, put it in the savings economy, and you do that by having a higher real rate to attract more buyers. So we can see it going above 250. Uh, we think possibly, possibly 3% right. very top end. I don't stop the show here, folks. This is so important. You've got Katie Kaminsky and Earl Davis pushing against the broad consensus, looking for lower price, higher yield. This is a global Wall Street uh, issue right now. Earl Davis, that comes down to the gamma that we see, the instability, the, the velocity, the convexity almost that we see in equities. If we get a Davis bond pricing, do things unravel? Do we get to an instability? Do we get to greater gamma? So the, the answer is yes, but for a very short period. Um, we believe 2024, the market, the economy will still do all right. Uh, so we do like credit. We do like risk assets, not at these valuations. So we do believe we unravel because you have to reprice for the higher discount rate. Once it does unravel, we will be buying we will be going overweight. And I think that's something important to note that, you know, these are the flows and ebbs of the market and it presents itself with opportunity. That's why, you know what, we're active managers and that's what we believe active managers should do. Earl, you were saying that real yields go to two and a half to three percent. Is that correct? Real that yields is correct. at a 10-year yeah, High probability, nothing's Which, for sure. But to me, this is the lead of this whole thing because a lot of people are saying this is not driven by inflation. It's not driven by growth. It's driven by something else. What is that something else driving the real yield higher? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's expectations, you know. When you read history books uh, and the 70s and inflation, throughout the 60s, 70s, inflation was an annoyance. It wasn't public enemy number one. It wasn't until Reagan and Volcker came in where they said inflation's public enemy number one. We're going to grasp. We're going to cut it. We're going to get it down. Right now, we're still in the annoyance phase of, of, of uh, inflation. That's why we think it will persist. That's why we think this is a secular change towards high yields, because it takes a lot to get it to be public enemy number one. And we're not quite there yet. At this point, you said that you're going to be a buyer when there is some sort of unraveling. What kind of unraveling is going to cause you to be a buyer if everybody's been saying this? They're waiting for the dip to buy, and that's the reason why there hasn't been the dip. Yeah, you know what? We're, our, our, the way we take risk is a, is a mix of quantitative and qualitative. You know, we have structural risk and tactical risk. Our structural risk will be buying as, as yields get higher. We have our levels. We have our view. And then uh, we reassess as they get to those levels. But as I said, we're still short. We're still fairly significantly short. But we will be covering that on every, any further weakness and ultimately going long. How concerned are you about the quintuple risk that we keep talking about, that maybe we're seeing right now capitulation ahead of the market turning toward all of the expectations of slower growth, given shutdown, strikes, higher gas prices, student loan repayments, and just the rates, the cost of borrowing going up as much as it has? 
Hey, listen, I don't have any concern. And and the reason is I look at the market, it's all about framing and how you look at the market. So I look at the market like a Boeing, a Boeing airplane. So we're getting all these weather patterns hitting each other, low inflation, high growth, low growth, all this, and we're getting turbulence. And you know what? The turbulence could shake the plane. It could drop 500 feet, but it's going to survive coming out of it. So I have absolutely no worries about it, but I do believe right. we're going to have a lot of turbulence <clears throat> over the next year. Earl, very quickly here, and, and folks, we're going to get a little nerdy here, as we did with Katie Kaminsky. <coughs> Excuse me, Earl Davis, I've got Looney at a 134. It is stochastic, weak Canadian dollar at a 140. It's stochastic because the system's overcome by events. If I get an Earl Davis market, I get a stronger dollar, and does the stronger dollar itself solve its own problem? <laughs> that that is a great question, and I, I agree with the sequencing of that. The stock, what the stronger dollar itself does, it allows us to play out into our story where there's going to be some volatility in this quarter, but 2024 is going to be all right uh, economically. And the key to that stability from an economic perspective is a stable, strong dollar. So I think it allows us to play into the story of yes, yeah. we're going to have volatile times. But we're on the, the, the best of airplanes and we'll serve it's made for this and, and we'll be able to survive and not only survive, thrive. You have to remember, as the yields go higher, that's a longer expected return for retirees, for pensioners, for investors in bonds. There's going to be tremendous opportunity here. Right. And even though we believe we're in a secular bear market, I see 2024 being a cyclical bull for yields. This is fabulous. Earl Davis, thank you so much with BMO Asset Management. Folks, this is what it, this is what the show's about. You have Katie Kaminsky and Earl Davis back to back, both screaming about lower price, higher yield in the fixed income space is what a Monday morning is like. Don Cass emails in the day the liquidity died. <laughs> Let's talk about that. He's really building on the theme. The VIX, 18, Standard & Poor's 500, down two-tenths of a percent. Right now, we're looking, uh, coming up at a number of different events. You talk about the dollar, and you were talking about yeah. the yen and the weaker yen. And what I find interesting is uh, that the Bank of Go uh, Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda doubled down on his more stimulus yes. needed message overnight. And that's kind of what some people are saying is driving the latest leg weaker uh, for the yen, 148, 63. Yeah, They're not backing away. Well, you nailed this because rounded up a 149, and I don't know where they're, you know, it unravels for them, but this is one of the issues that gets you away from the calm and that we're a liquid or we're a solvent system. And Don Cass down in Florida, you should hear Don Cass play American Pie. It's just unbelievable. After throwing back a couple, it's you pretty know, wild. You know, it's just, just, just he, he was a Kidder Peabody years ago. I remember him singing Vincent, Starry, Starry Night. Da -da. <laughs> Don Cass did that so well. <laughs> Anyways, the day the liquidity day, he was a Kidder and he used to get, bring his guitar to events. The day the liquidity died is what this is about. No one's expecting the liquidity to die. We have a soft landing. We have a system here. No one's looking for the solvency liquidity debate out there given price move. No one is thinking we're going to get a credit crisis. That has shifted off the table. Some people said that what happened uh, was sort of a stress test back in March with some of the smaller banks and the banking failures, and it didn't yeah. lead to anything. So what will? And that seems to be off the table. My answer is Bramo nailed it. We're looking at foreign exchange. There's not a chief U.S. economist in America that does foreign exchange as tightly as Laura Ron. We'll talk to her in a moment here. We've got that yen out rounded up a 149 level. I've got Renminbi through to a 7.31 uh, this morning. Even Turkish Lira, let's go idiosyncratic. Lira, 27.2. Where else are you gonna get a Lira quote on a Monday? Bloomberg Surveillance, Radio, Television. The lack of reciprocity and level playing field from China, coupled with wider geopolitical shifts, have forced Europe to become more assertive. We stand at a crossroads. Uh, we can choose a path towards mutually beneficial relations, or we can uh, choose a path that slowly moves us apart. Uh, where the shared benefits we enjoyed in recent decades uh, weaken and fade. Mr. Dombrovskis, really, I've really grown to listen to the guy and like the guy a lot. He has been a public servant 
of the Baltic states and all the Baltic states and, and uh, also Europe as well. He's European Commission Executive VP and Trade Commissioner. He just he just works tirelessly. I'll get it out on a Monday. <laughs> it's all right. No, it's true. And I think that this is a really different tone yeah. that we've heard over this time. And I keep going back to Holger meeting where he was saying that, yeah, the European region may be willing to take yeah. some pain to uh, really execute some sort of greater de-risking or decoupling, whatever you want to call it, with China. Good morning across America on radio, on television, futures at negative 10, Dow futures at negative 60. Bramo and me holding court here in London, eventful trip back. Thank you to all in London for a wonderful uh, week. Farrell on assignment after his Daniel Levy Tottenham interview caused a firestorm. His media people said, you can't leave now, you know. <laughs> You know, he's just got he's got such a role going that he's on assignment in London, also looking at 3000 square feet west of Mayfair, I believe this morning. Right now, we're going to digress to the delicacies that America faces in a fractured uh, Europe and that fractures mostly around a new Germany, around a Europe, around Germany. And of course, all that's going on with the war in Ukraine and the war with China. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo briefs this morning in charge of all of our European uh, coverage. Maria, we got here in a Europe after Merkel. As Dombrovsky speaks, as all the others blather in Brussels as you deal with daily, it's a changed Germany after Merkel, isn't it? It's a change to Germany, too, but I'm happy you mentioned uh, Dombrovskis because for an international audience, you need to understand that this is someone who really knows how the European Commission operates. He's not the most animated. Some would say he's a little bit dry, but this is a number or a man who really gets uh, the numbers and really gets the details. So obviously when he speaks, people do pay attention. And the tone in that speech, you know, when I heard that you wanted to talk about the speech, I was very happy because this speech, it really is quite something. I mean, you have to look at what he says. <coughs> Essentially, this is a crossroad for the right. relationship between the European Union and China. And he talks about either we fix it or prepare to lose investment. Well, OK, but Maria, the cutting edge to me, and this is over the weekend, folks, a lot of really smart coverage of the South China Sea and the expansion of America's military might in a new way in the Trans-Pacific. That's not a European discussion. Yeah, Maria, is it just an economic discussion? Is Europe dealing in a trade vacuum versus the United States? No, it is totally economic at this point. Uh, and the number, again, the, the figure that really gets Europeans has to do with the trade deficit between the European Union and China. And Tom, it is growing almost every year. It's almost now 400 billion euros. And that is a number that really underpins this entire tone, this changing tone, really, in a very big wave, you read between the lines between the European Union. I mean, when you get the guy who handles the trade portfolio that goes to China for four days and say, we have to fix the situation, otherwise the European Union may not be as keen in investing and in opening the market to China as we have been, that is a very significant change in tone. And again, it all goes back to that number. The Europeans are not happy with that trade deficit. The question is, of course, what happens with Germany? This is a country that has been the most uh, reluctant. They have been fearful at times about potential retaliation. But but also, Tom, you pick up a lot of different sentiment now in this condition and in this commission that says the fact that we listened to Germany for so long, that we were so fearful of China, has prevented action that was valid and legitimate. And this is what we heard from Holger meeting that suddenly <clears throat> there's a willingness to take pain in the near term to de-risk, yes. his word, decouple maybe somebody else's word with the Chinese economy. How much pushback is there right now from Germany? Uh, look, for the time being, not a lot. And remember, they actually agreed to that EV uh, probe. We should note it wasn't Germany that pushed for that probe. It was Emmanuel Macron of France that wanted this probe into the electric uh, vehicle because he does believe it is the future uh, of the sector. But again, beyond that, for the commission, what they say now, you should note also that the head of the commission is a German too, and she's willing to open this probe. I think what happens now is that the Europeans have to some extent realized that uh, trade is great, but the European single market, and this is a moneymaker for Europe, may have been abused uh, a number of times. So when they look at China, they take the experience of the solar panels. You know, Europe had the technology, but they got wiped out by Chinese companies. I think there's been a realization of that, and the political mood is changing. I'm not sure how much uh, Germany will be willing to run with it, but for the time being in Brussels, it really has, and this is a relationship that, honestly, in the past two years, has gone very cold. 
Which is a question about whether this is an alliance with the U.S. or whether this is Europe kind of in its uh, own right trying to make a move for long-term prosperity. How much is this being driven in tandem with other nations in the West versus a kind of go-it-alone, very European bespoke agreement that they're trying to reach with China? Uh, well, in terms of, uh, we all know that both in, in the United States and the European Union, everyone says uh, no to decouple, that is too late, that train left the station already, but yes to de-risk. And so the language on both sides of the Atlantic is identical. But when it comes to this push from the European Union, I would say it, it is very European. You know, I think when you look at the single market, we should really stress this, the Europeans view this as their crown jewel. This is the money maker. They have to protect it. And as you see now, they're willing to not just protect it with actions, but really a speech and a tone that is very different when it comes uh, to China. Again, for Valdez and Dabrowski is to go to China and say, we're at a crossroads. You either balance this relationship, we narrow that trade deficit, or prepare to lose investment. That is very significant. I mean, to me, the speech, it really is very important. How much meat is there behind this, though? How much willingness is there to actually levy tariffs or engage in some sort of deinvestment, even potentially at a loss? Uh, look, I think when it comes to the trade war, the European Union has been clear that they do not want to see a trade war. And they also believe that a lot of the trade that goes from the European Union to China is actually beneficial for the European Union. Everyone is clear uh, on that. Uh, the, the reality is, when you look at, however, the number that has triggered, maybe not alarms, but really concerns, is the fact that you see this trade deficit in favor of China constantly, consistently, every year, and it's growing, and no administration has been able to narrow that. Then when you look at that speech, what Dombrowski right. gets to is, we don't want a trade war, but we need to narrow that trade deficit. It's 400 <clears throat> billion euros. It's enormous. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for the brief. From Europe there, and something that seems distant, but all of a sudden, it mixes in with American Chinese policy as well. Maria today in Brussels on the stridency of trade in Europe uh, as they look to China as well. You know, you, you miss, you, at least I'm sorry, you, you're one week in London, we're out of touch. You know, we're just like, we're just, don't, don't wait, you lose it? I, I think in any number of ways, I was looking at fun, like how are the Giants doing? They're terrible and the Jets, they had that terrible injury and Aaron Rodgers, the Padres, I think they won nine in a row, Tatis with a great catch. None of it matters. None of what we do matters, folks. Even Michael Purvis coming up with Talbachan. Because there's only one topic this morning. What's that, Tom? Here's a partial score. The Bears beat the Chiefs. No one cares. They don't care what we're doing as well. Taylor made an appearance. And this is, I can't even begin to explain the politics of Miss Swift at Arrowhead Stadium to her right, off her right shoulder, on radio, dressed in the garb of the uh, receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, Travis. Travis's brother Jason plays for the <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles. Okay, just, I'm curious, Tom. Taylor's an Eagles fan, okay. but she's wearing Chiefs red. Okay, so I, I knew you were going to go here. Taylor Swift is evidently having a romance with the Chiefs tight end. Unconfirmed, but we'll go there. Travis Kels. Kelsey. And Kelsey. Kelsey. Yeah, I'm nailing it. Um, even though she is an Eagles fan, and that is this the is news, huge. right? This, this is like bigger than Biden. How do, you, how do you catch up after you've been off for a week with what you need to know that <laughs> happened in the U.S.? I go to the afterthought. It's my, my, my load of American gossip. I do two uh -huh. things. I go to afterthought and get a briefing. And there's a tradition really back over 15 years. I go to Scarlet Foo, uh -huh. and Scarlet Foo is the surveillance celebrity lodestone, and she gives me a brief. Okay, so then she tells but strike, you. She knew the strike was over with the screenwriters before the screenwriters. <laughs> <laughs> no, because there was a romance between the screenwriters guild. I said, what's Oppenheimer and, uh, doing? And she yeah. said, it's great. And Barbie's like, the Barbie's doing something in Russia. And, you know, okay. all that's breaking up. But, I, you know, this Taylor Swift thing is really big. You make light of this. I'm not making this light of it. I mean, morning. it's really important. Wait, why, is do you, important. Why, why, is it, why is it the most <clears throat> seminal news item that you need to yeah, Well, they had a on. Super Bowl. And, and, and Mrs. Kelsey, Travis's mom, had to choose between Philadelphia and Kansas City. Did you see that Usher is going to headline the next Super Bowl? I saw that. Actually, this and is really cool. I said to my son, did you mm -hmm. hear this? And my son said to me, who's Usher? And that's actually a key question because for a lot of the younger kids, they First don't know the artists. week at Bloomberg, Matt Winkler, founder of Bloomberg, got approval from Reto Gagori. They put me up at the Ritz. I'm going down the elevator with this kid with diamond earrings in his ears. It was Usher. I was the only one on the elevator who didn't know who Usher was. <laughs> well, Usher, the Super Bowl. <laughs> there you go. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Uh, S&P futures in negative three.
we've seen phenomenal sort of narrowness in the US market. It's really hard for the market to look for a dovish Fed right now. The markets are going to have to accept that they really are willing to keep interest rates higher for longer. Our concern is that they are going to keep rates too high for too long. They're going to slow down growth too much. At some point, their likes are going to come in. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The quinfecta of threats heading into Halloween, the toxic brew Ooh. of different issues. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. John is off today uh, doing some really cool stuff, which we will bring to you later. And it is us back in New York. And I have to say, it feels different, Tom. Yeah, it's absolutely different here. It's a, there's a real change going on, and the news flow is absolutely extraordinary. And what we've really focused on through the hour in the economics, financial, investment markets is price down, yield up, uh, if we were to see that. Nobody, excuse me, did I get that right? Yeah, price down, yield up. <laughs> Crushing Got it. it. Doing great. And nobody's pricing that in right, right now. now we remember month after month, the yields would go up, especially on the long end, and you'd have all the bond bulls come <clears> out, and they would say it's time to buy. And this time feels different. Suddenly, all of the bond bears are lining up to say this is just, yeah. you know, the new normal. And that feels like a different set of parameters at a time where people are thinking maybe the economy can no. withstand it, maybe it can't, especially with some of the other risks, the strikes, uh, what we're seeing with gas prices, what we're seeing with a government shutdown. Yeah. Lisa's going to do the data check here, but you got a deterioration of the tape right now with the VIX over 18 solid, the 18.03. With Michael Purvis coming up, I think it's a perfect segue from what we did with Katie Kaminsky and with Earl uh, Davis. What I would say, Lisa, is it's a compendium of this day, this day, this day. It's adding up and to the gloom crew, you wonder when it breaks. That's sort of the tension that we have Monday morning. Two things. To me, I'm focused on what's going on in Detroit. The fact that we're going to have President Biden there tomorrow. We're going to have uh, we're going to have the former President Trump on Wednesday trying to rally the troops. And then later in the week, we get retail sales as well as core PCE. And to me, that in tandem with earnings from the likes of Nike, <clears throat> H&M, Costco, do consumers right. keep spending at a time where yields are climbing to the highest levels going back to uh, before the financial crisis? To take a look at what we're really watching today. It is the real yield. The, and that to well, me, yeah. and what you're talking about, yields higher. You can see the real yield going to the highest levels going back to 2009. You can see gas prices climbing. Uh, it, yet again, reversing as hedge funds get bullish to the I, greatest I, degree since 2000. For those who are not in the game, you're not part of Global Wall Street, we thank you for watching and listening every day. 2.11 on the 10-year inflation-adjusted yield permeates through the system. I can't emphasize enough how the effect here of taking us back to, I believe you said, Lisa, 2009, or to take some of these levels like the mortgage rate, 7.75%, uh, two days ago, I believe it was, it takes us back to another time and place. A lot of people haven't been there. And there's a foreign exchange component to this as well, which is yes, strong dollar, yes. which is getting to a level that a lot of people think is disruptive. We heard that yet, uh, last week from a number of different guests in London. The euro hovering near its weakest going back to March. You could see the dollar ascendant. But with the yen weakening to such a great degree and uh, and in Ueda, Governor Ueda, not backing down. Again, these different features that just well, paint a less stable backdrop with very new contours. I know you wanna, you're gonna wanna through the data check and get Michael in here, but to me, the basic idea, folks, is you can, you can warble gaily about equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, but you never know what's gonna be the catalyst to break. Right. I mean, but, I'm not saying it's the real yield. It could be, uh, so, you know, I'm not, it, it won't be something dramatic like Argentinian peso. But it's talking to Looney with Earl Davis. You know, it could be Looney going out to 135, 136. You just don't know. We're seeing weakness and what really comes after a particular weakness in the Magnificent Seven. We're seeing S&P futures down three tenths of a percent. NASDAQ continuing to underperform. And that to me is interesting at a moment where it had been the stalwart. Uh, meanwhile, you do see a bit of dollar strength. 106.32 still firmly below 107 for the euro. And that 10 year yield crossing the 4.5% uh, <clears throat> wow. threshold. Wow. So just continuing to climb higher to some of the uh, post-crisis highs. And moments ago, perfect timing. Bridgewater of Connecticut, it's a startup uh, shop up in Connecticut outside New York City. Bridgewater says, quote, Japan's move away from negative rates. 
now looks overdue, and that's some of that tension of yen at 149. Joining us, Michael Purvis, founder and CEO of Tabak and Capital Advisors, to put together how different this landscape really feels. Michael, from your landscape, from your perspective, do you think that yields can continue to climb from here, or is this a topping out as people finally capitulate? Look, I think you know, take the ten-year nominal yield. I think there's a, there's a there's sort of a big technical air pocket to you know, 4.75 and then 5% here. Um, you know, there, if you look at technicals on the 10-year yield, it, I mean, those are looking like, a you know, Bitcoin did a couple of years back, right? I mean, it, it just looks like it's going higher here. Um, but I think, you know, when you think about some of the fundamental underpinnings of it, you know, you've got a situation where term premia, um, you can measure it a couple of different ways, but that, that has been expanding. You were just talking about Japan and the BOJ, you're looking at uh, interest rates around the world shifting higher. That means the foreign anchor of Japanese or, say, German sovereign paper is not what it used to be. You know, it was just a couple of years ago we had, what, 18 or $19 trillion in negative yielding debt. That's down to half a trillion today, and it looks like that half a trillion is heading to zero pretty fast there. So I, I think there's, there, you know, this is a Treasury sell-off very different from last year's Treasury sell-off. Last year was about you know how many hikes is 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 Bernanke, is uh, excuse me Powell going to give us? What is CPI going to do this year? It's much more about really I think roping through where our star is going to be, where Fed policy is going to be over the longer run. So I think yeah, I think the ten years going to keep shifting higher here. Just to double down quickly on what uh, Tom just mentioned with Bridgewater, are you saying that Bank of Japan is sort of inevitably going to also back away? That they're the next stone to kind of drop in the steady march toward higher benchmark rates? <laughs> Look, I, I think right now the BOJ is playing uh, playing with fire a little bit with a currency with a country that imports all its oil. Right now, you're you know you, you, it's a stretch to call the dollar a petro currency, but relative to Japan and frankly Europe, we kind of are because we're not an importer of oil like we used to be, and oil is a big part of our oil extraction is a big part of our economy. We're not, not we're you know, now producing uh, as much as we ever have than in the United States' history. Japan, of course, doesn't have that ability. So if the dollar rallies and, say, crude jumps another 10 15 20 you're going to start looking at the yen at a very difficult place, which means either the BOJ has to join the hawking party, if you will, or you're going to see some really, really interesting and potentially <laughs> dangerous dynamics play out in a very important economy. Mm -hmm. And that could be that could be, a, you know, one of the tail risks that you know, all the markets are going to have to contend with in the coming months if the BOJ right. continues to play this game. Michael, what do you do if you get a correction? It's been so long since we've had one. I take a immense issue. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I take a immense issue with where we are now, the gloom and uh, all that is well. You know, I, I, I look, Michael, we've got the SPX down 5%, five, 5% five Dow down a little bit more, NASDAQ down 7%. I'm going to call it a summertime drawdown. That's not a correction. Can you see right. a correction coming? Can you plan for it? Well, I'd say, I'd, I'd say it this way, Tom. I think there's parts of the market that have been very overextended. That's the Magnificent Seven, the big tech part of the market. I think if I'm right that that nominal real longer term interest rates are going to settle into a higher floor than what they had been, then um, I think those valuations are going to come down unless they, um, you know, look, if, if they blow out earnings, you know, in the next uh, quarter, um, that's now not too far away, you know, okay, you can maybe still have some AI buzz hitting those things. But I think what I'm expecting to happen is that valuation will adjust lower on the big tech part of the market and the so call it the everything else part of the market will be okay because the valuation right. is not overextended there. With all that said, I'm kind of looking more of a range bound uh, S and P into into the rest of the year and frankly right. into 2024 because the earnings growth in 2024 is probably, in my estimation, is going to be right. mid single digits. On dollar call DXY, if it was to break out higher, we talked about the Plaza Court earlier. Let's not do that now. But Michael Purvis, the basic idea here is dollar strength becomes pointy, becomes stochastic because people say no. Are the institutional forces in place that if we do get a renewed dollar strength, it can reverse rapidly? Look, I, I think, you know, there's sort of two tall, you know, there's a couple of different types of dollar strengths. One is from a 
risk off shock because something bad happens in the world and the dollar gets bid in, in sort of a reactionary form. I think what's happening here is, is that because real interest rates um, and nominal interest rates in the United States are just heading in a higher place than they are relative to Europe or Japan, the two other most important economies and currencies, you're looking at a situation where the dollar looks like it's going to have this sort of structural support here um, that's more gradual. It's not a shock type of dollar rally. It's more of a keep a dollar stronger, longer, uh, if you will. And that's reinforced by, you know, if oil continues to stay in these higher levels, I think it's going to, you know, keep reinforcing that uh, we don't have the hydrocarbon vulnerability that Japan and Europe uh, have. So I think that's going to be a sort of more of a long term weight over certain asset classes like EM equities and and other, you know, more dollar sensitive assets. Just quickly here, Michael, what's your highest conviction right now? My highest uh, conviction is that I think we're going to start seeing um, some of the big tech continue to sell off here, just not because there's something bad per se happening, but just simply valuation adjustment against higher um, uh, longer term interest rates. So, you know, I went out with NVIDIA puts in early August and I'm, I'm holding on to those. Michael Purvis, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Michael Purvis with Tallback and Capital years ago, this is a huge, ginormous call on ADX. Uh, why on, on the currency dynamics of the Pacific Rim uh, as well. The tape deteriorates. I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but the tape deteriorates. Lisa, futures negative 11. Uh, the VIX out to 18.07. I got a three tenths of a percent move on NASDAQ. And to me, it's like the way it's deteriorating, it's just giving, the bid's just giving away here is how would it frame that? To me, it feels like suddenly real rates are very much in the focus. And there's a question about how much further valuations can, can <clears throat> continue to rich in if you have yeah, this kind of rate backdrop. Well, you get into first, you know, inventories, last in, first out and all that. You got the retail people coming up. It affects them just like it affects the banks coming up. JP Morgan, October th uh, 13th. A lot going on here. Uh, to say the least. Standard & Poor's 500 down three-tenths of a percent. In the backdrop of all of this, Tom, there's a question about going back to the office. Did you see the story in the journal over the weekend about people counting badges in and out to determine oh, yeah. how often people are oh, yeah. in the office? And it did. Uh, they did some surveys of yeah. office attendance requirements. About one in five require five days a week back in the office. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an important thing. There's like 21,000 people here at Bloomberg making the terminal go every morning, all the different things that we do. And I'm the only one who doesn't have a badge. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't badge in. They inserted a chip. Oh, is that right? Yeah, right here. They put a chip in right here. So you badge in A little bit home. lower. You have to yeah, badge it's in like, It's King. like the dogs have she the security it. thing in case they get stolen. Uh, kennel fee and vet building. You know, Mike put a chip in right here. Oh, so I don't have a badge. That's just, right. You just sort of beep just, you know, every time you walk just in. Just go and and It's talking. Exactly. Is there a shock you unit? shock. It works out. You know, there is this question about when this is actually going to bring some sort of reduction and vacancies, and you're seeing that on the margins in certain yeah. places, but not really. I mean, you were saying it feels like it still is just about. Yeah, it's there, and I think the interviews today have been, the conversations, I should say, have been really, really good here. Terry Haynes uh, coming up. But the heart of the matter to me is when in doubt, you follow the deepest, broadest market. And even if you're not part of Global Wall Street, folks, on radio, on television, Get up to speed on your choices of foreign exchange. Terry Haynes doesn't know anything about foreign exchange. That's why we're having him on. Great. There's going to be a shutdown. They're going to stop printing dollars there on that road from Reagan into the United States. Treasury's going to... Sh hey, Terry Haynes is so august, his, his name was on the dollar once. You know, he signed it you know, and, and all that. Coming up on Washington on your shutdown across America on a president. With the picket lines, Terry Haynes, Pangina Policy, we'll do that next. Futures deteriorate, negative 11. Good morning. He is proud of being the most pro-union, pro-worker president, not only compared to the Trump administration with its anti-union policies, uh, but really compared to any modern president. These auto companies can thrive in a win-win deal that does what the president has called for, which is to say that uh, record profits should lead to record pay and record benefits for the workers who are creating all that value. On CNN, Peter Buttigieg, the U.S. Secretary of Transportation there, talking up where we are. Uh, I had a three and a half hour plane delay. We circled over White River Junction. 
for 40 minutes. I sat on the runway at Newark at 20 minutes. And then I called, the, I called the Secretary of Transportation. Oh, is that right? What they say? And I said, you know, what do we do? We'll go staff It was the, uh, sport coming power. home. You know, well, you know, you, you know, come over and, you know, you wave at Iceland and you slide into Middletown and the Gulf Stream. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a different world after all. Uh, right now, futures negative 11. The tape is deteriorating on this Monday morning. Not sure what to make of it. Curve disinversion. Two's 10 spread out to 62 basis points. It was much more inverted weeks ago. My headline is I got a 2.11% on an inflation adjusted yield. Lisa, what, what gets you in the data? Is it the yen and dollar dynamics, stronger no, dollar? The fact that 10-year yields have crossed over the 4.5% yeah. uh, mark, once again, that it's being driven by real yields, to me, colors the entire discussion, which is we are seeing real yields dominate taking a little bit of the froth off the top. And to me, that's the real question at a time yeah. where there's a political brew underpinning Toxic this brew. with strikes, shutdowns, yeah. higher uh, borrowings, et cetera, at a time of, you know, otherwise strength and resilience, but for how long, do, 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 you know, that's sort of the, the question. I was I distracted in London and I did not notice that I believe Thursday last 7.75% on a 30 year mortgage. I missed that. And yeah, it, just, I mean, it wants up. Look, I've read so many notes about how the mortgage market, the housing market's broken, right? Essentially, nobody wants to buy an, an existing home because no one wants to pay that, right? So at what point do you get the price <clears throat> corrections if right. you get a functioning market? How does the Fed deal with this? I mean, it seems like they're not that concerned. Uh, right now, we're going to dive into uh, the toxic brew of our politics. Look for balance of power this evening. Amory Horton, Joe Matthew, Kaylee Lines helping out from time to time. Uh, there. It is just fascinating on shutdown, on strikes, and the rest in Washington. Terry Haynes is a student of this. He's founder of Pangea Policy. Always speaking to Terry Haynes is win-win. So we're going to win-win here in a lose-lose for the president. Terry, I'm going to cut to the chase. How does President Biden break the lose-lose moment? Uh, frankly, Tom, I'm not sure he can. Uh, uh, the president is now in a situation where he's he's constantly uh, having to shore up his base, uh, and, and in order to do that, since the base are, uh, you know, kind of small, small but powerful within the Democratic Party constituencies, uh, teachers unions, uh, you know, the UAW, uh, you know, that sort of the, the green lobby, those sorts of people, uh, it makes it much harder for him to go to the center. And uh, and you see that kind of cul de sac in the in the uh, in the recent numbers uh, you and I were talking about on the break, where his uh, his approval rating is you know at best mm -hmm. a low low forty percent, but people nobody's giving him good marks on the economy. Uh, you know he you know is either even or loses to Trump. He certainly loses to Nikki Haley. You know all these right. sorts of things. And plus you know there's now a, a rising third party candidacy risk too. I, so. I, 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 I got, I, I got eight ways to go here, Terry, in the time we've got. The, the stew is so rich right now. And let me try the government shutdown. We've spoken to, we've spoken to people this morning who look at a government shutdown as an eight-day dalliance. That just seems too cavalier to me. What is the gravity, the, the reality, the gravity of a shutdown? What I've been telling markets for quite some time is first, the shutdown's likely. Secondly, and I think really importantly this week, markets need to understand this is not the same old one and done uh, that they've been used to that doesn't really have any economic impact. Uh, this is going to go on for about three months. The reason why it's going to go on for about three months is with stop starts. Sometimes the government will be funded, sometimes it won't, is that they haven't is you've you've got Biden kind of in the tank on uh, on his own numbers. You've got a Congress that bipartisan, bicameral, that's lazy. These people took seven weeks off instead of dealing with this, and now here we are. So this crisis is is, is by and large self created, uh, but they haven't done any work on appropriations bills, which they need to do. Uh, they haven't done they haven't finished anything. It'll take them the next three months in order to finish the defense authorization and the defense spending bills. Then by which time the rest of the approps uh, uh, catch up and they can actually do something before Christmas. Why that's important is that according to the budget deal, a 1% cut goes into effect in January. Uh, if, no, if no deals are done, nobody wants that. So therefore that's the three month time period. Why that matters for markets is that there will be more volatility in areas that are heavily dependent on government uh, defense. Does it get funded at what level, who, how, same with healthcare. So it's, it's a different deal. 
Amid all these discussions about cuts to the deficit, is there any discussion about Social Security, about Medicare, about Medicaid, about the major costs that the nation is incurring? No, not at all. Not what, even close. So no. what does that say to you uh, in terms no, of the no theater? There's no political will or courage to do that. I'm sorry, Lisa. So, no, but Terry, I mean, what does that say to you about how much this is theater and how much this is ideology and how much this is sort of a de facto necessity of a shutdown, regardless of any kind of agreements or technical anything? I increasingly have to restrain myself from saying kabuki theater over and over um, because it is. Uh, this is self-created theater. Anytime you have a bunch of people who, are, who claim to be uh, seriously concerned, uh, Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate, whoever, seriously concerned about the direction of the country, you know, and want their policy uh, priorities put in place, and yet for seven weeks don't do anything about it, uh, that will tell you everything you need to know about the seriousness of, uh, of those people and their desire to actually get something fundamental done. Who is this Kabuki theater for, and is it working? Uh, it's for the uh, it's for the bases of the parties. It's for uh, those who fundraise off of uh, off of outrage, whether it be on the left or the right. And does it work? Uh, works in the sense that uh, outrage uh, uh, outrage gets a response in righteous anger and uh, and you know more campaign contributions. Uh, does it work in the sense that they're any closer to solving the problems they claim to care about? No, it doesn't. Terry, I want to go back to brass tacks, which is way out in November, the first Tuesday of November. President mm -hmm. Biden won over 80 million votes in the last election. No one's had more votes in an election ever than the loser, Donald Trump. That mm -hmm. tells me it's massively about turnout. Can you gauge now in any way, shape or form the emotion of turnout in October of next year? Uh, my instinct on this is that the uh, is that the outrage uh, turnout uh, is driven by uh, is driven by outrage and driven by kind of galvanized on issues. Uh, my sense is that uh, those who are outraged on the Republican slash right side uh, probably uh, probably have more energy uh, than the folks that are outraged on the left. Uh, not only that, but uh, you know, you you point to Biden's uh, vote totals. Uh, you know, massive amount of those uh, those overvotes are uh, are California and New York places where uh, it's pretty much just running up the score. Uh, it's a world where uh, the president won four states by a combined, you know, roughly hundred thousand yeah. or less, uh, and so that turnout's going to make all the difference. I think the outrage uh, that comes from a lack of movement in Washington uh, just just stokes things a little bit more. Terry Haynes, thank you so much with Pangea Policy, or again, Balance of Power tonight across Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Every once in a while, a headline comes across and you stop. It's a Bramo quality headline, to say the least. There it is, just, just in technicolor. Well, basically, you could see 10-year, 30-year 30 30 yields both rising to post-crisis highs. Highs of the cycle, we were just talking about the 4.5% 10-year Treasury yield. You could see that 30-year yield, 4.6%. Yeah. These are round numbers. Up less has been the two-year yield. We have seen a plateauing out, which really highlights that <clears throat> flattening of the curve that Katie Kaminsky was talking about, Tom. Please stay with us for continued market coverage here. It's not overt yet it's not demonstrative but boy is there a tight correlation across equities bonds currencies commodities dollar strength comes up here uh, with a vengeance the real yield 2.12 percent uh, again and you know I, I guess lisa more than anything i've got to go to the currency market you know i think you're going to get sterling uh, you know, you're going to get a 121 handle on sterling. Pharaoh's never going to come back. <laughs> dollar strength. Say, I'm here. I'm in has London. Has been uh, Mother the story. Yeah, although he's got to get paid in dollars to really make it work. Well, that's why he's just living large there, uh, west of Mayfair. Laura Rahm next. Perfectly timed. Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance on Radio and Television and Market Check in Order. It's pretty much, Bramo predicted this to be blunt. We're up a stick on the VIX, 18.19 with tape deterioration. It's not a big deterioration, but there's a weight to the tape 
uh, this morning. That's extraordinary. Futures at negative 13. Again, the VIX 18.19. And Lisa, history being made in the bond market, higher yields. The idea of 10-year and 30-year treasuries, both crossing round numbers, 4.5 on the 10-year, 4.6 on the 30-year. Looking out to some of the highest yields going back to uh, 2011 for the 30-year and well before that. 2006 for the 10 year. At what point do we reach some sort of capitulation, Tom? That to me is sort of the key question. Are we reaching a point where people are saying this is sustainable or people throwing in the towel on being bond bulls, which a lot of people said they've been? Well, it's going to be interesting to see. And the the tandem that we had at Katie Kaminsky and Earl Davis here, uh, Alpha Simplex and BMO Capital Markets, uh, the, the basic idea that both of them from two different worlds are saying, okay, what happens if we get price down yield up? Besides an 8% mortgage rate, I think it's a joint study on a Monday. And at what point does some of the froth mm-hmm. start to come off the risk asset sphere, right? Yeah. This is sort of the interesting other side is that people are saying maybe we can live here, right? This is okay. This is sustainable. Okay. Well, is that if that's the case, how much strength does there have yeah. to be? given the quintuple threat that we've been talking about. We were jetting uh, back, uh, li- living lazy, living large, and our team worked through the weekend on market coverage. We'll get to Laura Ram here uh, in a moment, just a perfect moment to speak to Ms. Ram, Chief U.S. Economist, FS Investments on Foreign Exchange. But first, we have to go to head of our surveillance shutdown central. <laughs> Michael McKee joins us, Bloomberg International Economics and Shutdown Correspondent. Uh, this morning. I know it's funny, but it's not. Give us one vignette of the pain that will be inflicted upon this government shutdown. No, oh, there are so many, but I think uh, one easy thing to look at is uh, the number of people who get furloughed, who don't have any money coming in, their kids become eligible for reduced or free meals, but there's no money for the reduced or free meals. So there's be a lot of pain and suffering, at the, especially in lower income levels because of this. It won't be a huge macro issue unless it lasts for a long time. And I'm, I'm afraid that Terry Haynes is probably right, that this could go on for months. And if that's the case, then we have some real problems beyond just money. And we're talking about also the idea of a data dependent Fed at a time where data might not come at all. What data might we not get if the government shuts down, as most people actually expect as the base case? Well, the first thing you won't get is construction spending, which is due next Monday. Uh, We have the JOLTS report next week, jobless claims, obviously, factory orders, and, of course, September payrolls, the jobs report, which is considered reasonably important to the Fed and their uh, futures. Uh, We also uh, wouldn't get... Uh, the next month's CPI if it continues to go on because there won't be anybody to collect the data for October. Take us behind the closed doors and are there people still collecting the data and just not releasing it or are they not even collecting the data? Really giving us a dark period of uh, of data vacuum at a time where data has never been more important. Well, for some of the uh, numbers, data comes in. The establishment survey is a survey of companies and they send their data in, but somebody has to collate that. Uh, There may be a certain number of people who are brought in to work without pay to put things like that together. But in previous shutdowns, we have not had the government release data. The last one we had, uh, if you remember back that far in 2019, when it was finally ended, we went several months without getting data until they could Mm -hmm. catch up to everything. So if you're the Fed trying to make policy November 1st or December 13th, Mm -hmm. you may have a real problem. In in the 142 papers on your desk that that, uh, amazingly folks are read, I should say that uh, (laughs) different than me, on the 142 papers on your desk, is there a political tinge to a shutdown? Are Democrats hurt harder than Republicans or vice versa? Well, historically, it's been Republicans who've taken the blame, even uh, when there was once a a shutdown during the Obama administration, uh, because the Obama administration wouldn't give But what about the public? What about The the public tends to blame Republicans for it. Now, the the question is, we're far enough away from an election. If this goes on for a long time and there's some lasting damage, then it might okay, linger. But, but when you look at the consumer, it, I, I've gone back and looked at the consumer sentiment numbers. Right. People don't even notice. It doesn't register. It doesn't show up in consumer sentiment. And then it certainly doesn't show up okay. really in spending. 
Uh, surveillance shutdown central there, Michael McKeon. He'll be giving us a lot of perspective on this into a potential uh, shutdown. Laura Ram joins right now, chief U.S. economist at FS Investments. A timely interview, Lisa, to say the least. Especially given the fact that we might be heading into a vacuum of information. Laura, you are, I'm sure, listening to Michael McKee talking about what we may not get going into a dark period at a data-dependent Federal Reserve making crucial decisions. How important is that aspect of some sort of shutdown that is underappreciated in markets? I think it's very important because you still have a real disconnect between what the Fed says they want to do and what markets are expecting. And the only way to really close that gap is to for the Fed to really, you know, come in and jawbone markets. And they would ostensibly use the data to do that if they don't have the data to back it up. And, you know, listen, the economy is, has been very strong. Uh, the data has looked really solid. And I think the Fed has absolutely used that as a foundation to try to push markets towards the fact that we both need, you know, maybe another rate hike, but also are not going to be cutting. And all of that is data based. So to your point, it, it really makes it hard for them to close the gap between what I think they've signaled to us as policy, like in the dot plots, in the economic projections and what markets are pricing. There's a real tension right now. A number of guests have come on the show this morning and said that they expect yields to stay here for a longer period of time. This is the new reality. And they think that this economy can continue to keep going regardless of the fact that it is that much more expensive and discretionary income is going to a lot more basic, uh, basic assets around the house. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that it's getting to the point where these yields are unsustainable? So it's a two part answer because I don't think that these yields are unsustainable. And in fact, if you look at you know, I think everybody is now looking at the mid 90s as a guidepost. The one time the Fed was able to raise rates and not cause a recession, the Fed held the Fed funds rate in restrictive territory for three years. And long term interest rates were quite a bit higher than they are today. I think that flattening this sort of bearish steepening where bonds are sold off across the curve is probably going to continue. Um, I think there's a huge disconnect which I think people aren't talking about enough between equities, expecting the economy to be strong and revising earnings estimates up for next year. I mean, right now, consensus earnings estimates are up 10, 15 percent next year. Yeah. You know, if you just look at the broadest base, that is really implies significant economic acceleration from a level where we're already fairly <clears throat> strong. You can't get that without the Fed not only really keeping rates where they are, but even considering rate hikes into 2024. That's not my <clears throat> forecast. I think the economy is going to be slower next year and that their earnings estimates are too optimistic. But this is a big disconnect that I think we really yeah. aren't shining a light on. Uh, Laura, how close are we? And I don't mean Plaza Accord. Someone dismissed that earlier this morning. But Laura, how close are we to where the stochastic history of strong dollar a just Fed policy, where Powell is overcome by strong dollar, like on DXY 105 tending to 106. Are we getting it close to where those dynamics take over Fed decision making? I, I don't think we're there yet, Tom. And I do think the dollar is going to continue to strengthen significantly into mm -hmm. year end. I think that the rate of change is really important when you think about the Fed, um, you know, in, in taking that on as part of their decision. And I think when the Fed looks at the landscape today, they're seeing shadow tightening, I call it, coming from a lot of places, the higher oil prices, the dollar, the real interest rate dynamic. I don't think that they're displeased with that. I think this is kind of their bargain with markets. Like, we won't give you a lot of rate hikes if you will allow this tightening to kind of it continue to bubble up in the background and squeeze demand over the longer term. I think if it moves really fast, that's when you start to see the Fed take this into place. And listen, you know, you and I have been here before. I do not put it yeah. past FX to be the market that really breaks out. It is highly volatile, highly volatile when you least expect it. And I don't put it past FX, especially in the emerging markets, mm -hmm. to really come out of left field and, and cause a broader uh, financial market disruption. You know, I was talking to John, uh, Lara, he's stuck in the United Kingdom. You know, he's working on a project over there. And I was just telling him that it was amazing to see the autumnal leaves and the glow of October 
within the hurricane or whatever we're having in New York. The sun came out, what, a week ago? Yeah, it's Something been a long like time. That. We, last time we were here. Laura, it's a time of season where we go into the seasonal quarter and retail becomes important. What's the American consumer going to do? Right now, the it is fascinating that given how strong the economy is and given how much people are spending, consumer sentiment is still dragging. I really chalk that up to inflation. I think the Fed is patting themselves on the back that inflation is down to, you know, three and a half, four percent. Um, for the households, the sticker shock that they're still experiencing is a very clear and present pain point. So I think from here, the consumer slows. The student loan, um, you know, starting up again, those student loan payments are a marginal impact to me. It's not going to be the main driver. But uh, despite the fact that households really, I think, have a solid foundation, it gets slower from here because, frankly, this level of spending right now is unsustainable. Do you think that that means hard landing? Does that mean recession or does that just mean a slowing down and a sort of disinflating of the economic trajectory? I've been in camp recession, um, you know, thinking that the Fed, given the dramatic and aggressive nature of this Fed rate hike, is uh, going to cause the economy to contract sometime. I originally had said the beginning of next year. Obviously, right now, the way things are going, that seems like it's going to be pushed out. I think all the reasons why I was thinking this would be a mild recession may be the reason why we just get a slowdown and not a full on contraction. You know, that list includes scarcity of labor. It includes the CHIPS Act. It includes uh, just broader general underinvestment in our economy that we're playing catch up on now. Um, these were reasons why I had sort of said, ah, oh, you know, recession, but more mild, you know, may keep us on the line of a soft landing. But either way, I think, you know, when I look at the bond market, it's it's pricing in a slowdown. When I look at the equity market, it's not. And, you know, listen, the equity market is a historically terrible indicator of the economic cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think we all need to acknowledge that just because yeah. equities are, are up and they're not recently up. But just because they're up doesn't mean that we're out of the woods on the economic cycle. Laura Rame, thank you so much. FS Investments there, beautifully linking in foreign exchange with DXY rounded up to 106, seeing strong dollar. Uh, this morning. The markets are interesting. It's not an abrupt move, but nevertheless, a VIX over 18 and the Standard & Poor's 500 down three tenths of a percent. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with former FDIC chair Sheila Baer, and it comes at a time where we're looking at a new rate regime. And my key question to her is just, can we survive this? What does this do to the banks? Did the uh, whole banking crisis of earlier this year mean anything? Yeah. Or did it just show the resilience of an economy and a banking system that can, to use your phrase, uh, adapt and adjust? Hugely well-timed. Out of the academics of uh, uh, Northampton and Amherst, Massachusetts, and on to some real public service for the country during, to say the least, some trying times. And to stagger from Robert McTeer in the 80s to Sheila Bear from, you know, the recent times, wither our banks. That's yeah. not a small issue. It's off my radar. I'm guilty of this. But there they are. It's not one and done with Silicon Valley Bank, is well, it? And where do they lend, right? And we were in London last week at the credit conference that we uh, put on. And we were talking about how a lot of these private asset managers really want to take on the role of these banks. And the banks are giving it to them because they can't make a profit. So where does that put the regulatory oversight? Where does that put some of the uh, questions around who's going to be doing lending at a time where lending is a lot more expensive? Uh, you look at a monthly chart of the... Keith Briet uh, index and uh, the 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 answer is southish and you know do you come back and retest pandemic lows which maybe was unimaginable here and a timely conversation for Global Wall Street Sheila Bear will join us she's the former FDIC chair look for that futures uh, modest deterioration futures at negative 11 the VIX out over 18 18.09 we are on radio we are on television. For Global Wall Street, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. In general, in the globe, you know, we are going through very challenging uh, times in terms of macroeconomic uh, 
uh, in terms of yeah, macroeconomic picture, uh, of course, uh, the geopolitical tensions are not helping uh, at this stage. Uh, you know, but I, I do believe that uh, many investors still see uh, the long-term potential of China. Uh, it's exactly how to navigate uh, uh, the current situation that makes uh, our job even more important. Over in China, Sergio Armadi, the head of UBS, talking about the relationship in that nation as well as some of the uh, fund exploration with respect to Credit Suisse and the whole uh, assembly there. Today we've been talking about a number of different events this week, in particular having to do with the strikes, Tom, and I was noticing the divergence between the companies that are getting close to resolving the strikes and those that are really in the heart of it. And you could see that with Disney and Netflix shares both up uh, in pre-market trading on the news that we got that there might be some sort of deal with the Writers Guild and that they're going to uh, get some sort of moving forward with respect to Hollywood. Disney shares up about a half yeah. percent. Netflix shares up about one percent. Solantis on the flip side down 1.3 percent as those strikes expand. Well, today. the strikes expand, but I don't know how to conflate L.A. strikes of a really strange Hollywood system with people making 60,000 bucks a year on a assembly line in Detroit. I just, people conflate the two together and I'm just not sure that's correct. There is a way to conflate them that I think is really important, which is technological changes have kind of trumped all to sort of create a new urgency. Artificial intelligence very much in the forefront of the discussion over in uh, Hollywood. This question also of streaming and how you get royalties, how you get fees. And over in the uh, auto manufacturing side, the question of electric vehicles, new production facilities. These are the new technologies creating the frameworks of a lot of angst, how you ensure job security in a, in a world that's moving really quickly. It's going to be, I, I, just to me, it's, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. I don't see any other way about it. What do you make of this market this morning? To me, it's just extraordinary. I got a 2.11 on the real yield. And, you know, we got, there's some tension out there with that headline we saw earlier on higher yields cycle high hearkening back to the time well, of bear. The question is, can we live with the yields like this? And can we move with them moving this quickly? Can we live with this idea of a fast moving <clears throat> freight train of people moving away from being bond bulls and going into being bond bears? And the answer is not clear, right? We've heard from guests who have different opinions. We just heard uh, from Laura Rahm, who is talking about how, no, it doesn't seem sustainable. Others saying, yes, it is. And here we are at a time where we might be going into a blackout period for data. <clears throat> so we can't really understand the ramifications from the economic economic standpoint in real time. In combat, sometimes people are called. Sheila Bear was of Kansas and the University of Massachusetts Amherst, a nodding acquaintance with Senator Dole of Kansas, and that began her public service to the nation. And then she was selected in 2006 for the boring job of being FDIC chair in the banking system. This extended out to a not so boring 2007 eight, nine, she survived to 2011. She uh, is the author of two new children's books. They're out October 1, Money Wizards. I didn't read that in 2007. <laughs> but Daisy Bubble about market speculation, that one I read cover to cover. Sheila Bear joins us this morning uh, here in another time and place from 2007. Sheila, if I'd read Daisy Bubble on that August afternoon in 2007, where LIBOR OIS went out forced to enter deviations, what would you have written about to sprightly seven-year-olds? Well, uh, to you, I would have said you should have read Daisy Bubble probably in 2002, 2003, when the housing bubble was starting yeah. off. Uh, yeah, I would say to young people, as I say in the book, and there's some back matter in the book that talks a bit about the housing bubble and the more recent uh, crypto bubble, that uh, speculation is dangerous. You know, her behavior is dangerous. How many times? We told our kids, don't do something just because everybody else is. And bubbly markets are a lot about that. Gen Z has a word for it, fear of missing out, FOMO. You know, data right. and everybody else is getting in. And then the bubble pops, usually this, by the smart money selling. You were so, saying. Uh, yeah, for the investor, they should stay away, yeah. kids or adults. You were a saint with accolade from Democrats and Republicans alike about a patient approach in times of crisis. We had a banking crisis a number of months ago and we're already back to fear of missing out. That crisis is over, is it? Well, I, I hope the crisis is over. I, as I wrote at the time, I thought regulators did overreact. I'm not sure three mid-sized regional banks uh, failing was a crisis. They treated it as such. Uh, the rest is history. 
But yeah, I think more banks are going to fail. Uh, I, I think if properly managed, it will not be a crisis. Banks do fail. Uh, the reality is the very largest banks are too big to fail, notwithstanding our, our best efforts to try to kill that doctrine. And the smaller banks are heavily reliant on insured deposits, which are, are stickier than the regional banks are suffering some. They rely more on uninsured deposits where they're, where they're seeing outflows. But yeah, with uh, the, the inverted yield curve, been inverted for over a year now, you know, if your your deposit funding costs are going higher than your long-term loan rates, you got a big problem. And uh, with CRE out there, I can only assume there will be more bank failures. I don't think it will be a lot. I think that FDIC and other government agencies have the tools to deal with it. But yes, I do over the next you know, 12 to 18 months, I think there will be more bank failures. Let's put together some of the ideas that you're talking about. The concept of excesses, bubbles, people chasing uh, the FOMO trades, which we saw in mass right. over the past 10 years. And then this idea of a rate regime that harkens back to when you were FDIC chair for the first time. How much have we seen the excess bubbles kind of uh, worked through the system or are they yet to be worked through the system? In other words, are we still going to see that reckoning that people said would happen yeah. back in 2007, 2000, or back in, I should say, 2013? Yeah, so I, I think there's still there's some bubbles left uh, that need to be popped. Hopefully it'll be gradual. Uh, you're seeing valuations come down. Commercial real estate still inflated, but you're seeing some of that start to correct. The stock market, you know, I, I think it's probably got some ways to go to go down again. So uh, it's just a matter of whether we can, you know, the expectations are right. People understand what's going on and we can manage it. And uh, but, yeah, I, I think there's there's still uh, many shoes left to drop. And, of course, just in terms of credit markets and distress in uh, in uh, debt refinancing, we've got a lot of corporate debt refinancing over the next couple of years. A lot of that CRE debt is expiring, needs to be refinanced. So um, these are shoes that are left to drop, which is why, even though I'm an inflation hawk, I am glad. I am so glad that the Fed has been hitting pause. I think they were going too fast. There's only so much of this transition to higher rates that the economy can absorb uh, without triggering a very uh, broader problems in the financial sector and the overall economy. And Sheila, you've been saying that you think that ultimately it's good to have uh, the I discipline do. that higher yields does invoke, that they do invoke. But you think it's been too fast. Do you think that that ensures something of a recession that people are yeah. perhaps overlooking? Well, I think if you go too fast, then you do trigger a crisis. And then the Fed has to do U-turn and ratchet back down. And you start this whole problem all over again. There's, there's not much research that shows low rates boost you know, sustainable economic growth. Yeah, there's a lot of research that shows it harms productivity. Larger companies uh, benefit much uh, more than uh, than smaller ones. Uh, actually, high rates help the smaller businesses because they, they get their credit from banks. It's easier to lend for banks if the rates are higher. And even though some pain in the banking system now, if we can transition into a more normalized, higher rate environment, overall, I think that will make it make the traditional banking system, the banks that make deposits and make loans, stronger. Right. So, you know, I've been on a lot of corporate boards since leaving. Uh, if my sense is, is that they don't borrow to invest in productivity. I mean, that comes out of operating income. They want to do that anyway. So if you just make it cheaper to borrow, mm -hmm. you know, that goes into M&A activity, might go into buybacks. There's really no evidence that the ability to borrow cheaply by large companies goes into productivity. And I think the low productivity we've had since this uh, very accommodative right. uh, policy stance has taken hold shows that. Sheila, thank you so much. Sheila Baer, the former president of Washington sure. College of Maryland, former FDIC chair as well this morning. We haven't talked enough about it. It's been percolating uh, there, but you get out a technical chart of the Keith, Bri Keith Briette and Woods Index. And I'm sorry, it's not pretty. There's no. just no other way to put it. I mean, people say banking crisis averted, but not for people who own those shares and not necessarily in terms of valuations. But what Sheila was just saying there is at a certain point, there needs to be more of a reckoning that hasn't really come to the fore. And a lot of people have been pointing to commercial real estate recently, including some pretty bank ex uh, big bank executives. So again, there's been a lot of threat, but it hasn't come to the fore yet, except for in pockets like the shares yeah. of some of these banks. Yeah, we're gonna have to see, to say uh, the least. Coming up here on, on Bloomberg Radio, Paul Sweeney and I, Phil Camparelli, JP Morgan Asset Management. On the open, Young Pharaoh is in London on assignment on TV, 
It's the Bitcoin Open. <laughs> we'll be doing that with Matt Miller sitting in for Mr. Farrell. On Bitcoin, Michael Zizis, George Kongalvis, Sarah Hunt. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us. <laughs> 